of uh, Middle East Ophthalmological Meeting and also on behalf of Al Qasmi Ophthalmological International uh, Conference and also on behalf of North Emirate Dubai Retina Club and Anthea Sigmund uh, of North Emirate Dubai Retina Club. I would like to thank uh, my eminent speaker here and uh, thanks for them for accepting our invitation to be uh, in this uh, meeting. Uh, and also on behalf of uh, uh, all attendees also, uh, we'd like to thank our speakers. Uh, and I would like to thank also the attendees and participants for share, uh, participating with us and listening to us and supporting this uh, webinars. We are doing now every week one webinars. Uh, today, we, our topics is a little bit something different, uh, but it's very interesting. I hope you will enjoy uh, listening to this uh, speaker, to those speakers, they are uh, very eminent in their uh, field. Uh, our first speaker, it will be my dear friend and brother, Dr. Amjad Hamad. He is an MD, MBA, Managing Partner of Saratoga Ophthalmology, CEO of the New York uh, Eye Surgical uh, Center in USA, a Clinical Professor of Ophthalmology, Albany Medical Center, USA, uh, and he is a past uh, president of New York State of Pharmological Society. Uh, Dr. Amjad, the mic is you, please. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad uh, Al Omari, Abu Abdul Wahab, and uh, okay. a dear colleague and friend. Uh, I want to first of all say thank you to everybody uh, here on this call. Thank you for the different, uh, the different presenters. Uh, for sharing the podium with me and thank you to all the attendees for taking the time out from a Friday, from a weekend or holiday uh, to attend. Uh, and uh, hopefully this will be instructional, useful and uh, collaborative where uh, we're gonna all build on uh, 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 the topics and subjects we're gonna be talking about. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Al Omari. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, 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 a, here in the role as an academician uh, a clinical professor of ophthalmology at Albany Medical College. Uh, my topic is going to be talking about endophthalmitis from the medical management aspect. And my col our colleague, Dr. Ramsey, is going to be talking about the surgical aspects of endophthalmitis management. And his talk will be following mine. So we're going to start off with a case presentation. Uh, this is something that we typically see very common in our offices, uh, either in the retina office, retina uh, practice, or in a general ophthalmology practice. Uh, a 45-year-old female uh, who has been un had an uncontrolled diabetes and has been diagnosed with moderate non-proliferative changes and clinically significant macular edema that has been depressing her visual acuity. She has extensive uh, 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 foveal edema and exudates, and her visual acuity in presentation was 2080 minus. Uh, we initiated her with Avacin, which is our routine go-to medication here in the United States in my office. And she improved, but there was still fluid after the third injection. So we switched to ILEA. And we'll give her ILEA injections every uh, six weeks. And she improved about 20, 40 plus with nice dramatic resolution of the macular edema. So she comes in one day for a routine OCT exam and the eye injection for her right eye. I typically alternate eyes. I don't typically do bilateral injections. And we did her ILEA injection. Everything went well and smoothly. But she called our office three days later and she said she has the dramatic decrease in her vision and she's been complaining of this mild aching pain since the morning. So uh, we immediately told her to come in. And this was her presentation when she came into the office. So uh, uh, her visual acuity had dropped down from 2040 to about counting fingers of one foot. And she has this red angry eye. Uh, you can see some corneal edema, uh, haziness due to uh, quite a bit of flare and uh, four plus cell in the AC and you can see a hypopian development. So this is kind of a, a, a classic presentation, kind of a nightmare scenario uh, uh, with a patient that's been doing really well and has a nice management plan and then comes in with this complication. So diagnosis is usually at this stage is not too hard to make. It's the management that is kind of tricky. So when, when we think about diagnosis, uh, 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 number one and, and that comes up to mind is bacterial endothelmitis. So endothelmitis, just to touch base, is uh, classified different methods. Uh, we're all aware that endothelmitis just means uh, inflammation uh, in the internal uh, structure of the eye. 
the aqueous humor and the vitreous and different classification systems as far as sterile versus infectious. And when we talk about infectious, we're talking either endogenous, which means that it's uh, a seeding from another source of infection somewhere else in the body versus exogenous, uh, introduced uh, organism into the eye via either trauma or via, via uh, surgical, which is another form of trauma through a surgical procedure. And then it can be classified by infectious organism. The most common, of course, uh, with exogenous is bacterial, uh, uh, the other forms could be fungal, parasitic, or viral. With endogenous, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, literature that says fungal might be the most common organism. And then another uh, form of classification of the thalamitis is by latency of symptoms. The acute, which is the first uh, week to two weeks after the inciting incident, versus delayed diagnosis. Uh, other formed terms are either latent in the thalamitis or indolent in the thalamitis. And uh, the classic one is pro probinobacterium acnes. Endothalmitis is rare, but we do so many procedures that it's not as rare as we would like it to be. Uh, almost everybody has been exposed to endothalmitis in their practice. Uh, this is a, a survey of different uh, 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 series of uh, uh, injections uh, that were uh, published in the literature going back to 2008 when uh, 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 the boom of uh, intraocular injections first started. And you can see that even though some series had zero uh, uh, cases of endothalmitis, extremely rare. And, and the post intravitreal injection, uh, the, the, uh, on average, is an incidence of one in 3,000 to one in 5,000. Uh, the original uh, uh, the, uh, Lucentis and the, uh, studies uh, said uh, a rate of about one in 17,000, but in real practice, um, it's much more common. Uh, analysis of CMS, which is the uh, reimbursement uh, data, which shows um, that uh, in the real life, people, when they bill for procedures, it's about one in 1,000. So there are some people saying that in actual practice, not published practice, but in actual practice in the United States, there might be one in 1,000 might be the rate of endothelmitis post-injections. Uh, Post-caract, uh, the classic is one in 1,000. But with current prophylaxis, uh, the rate has been substantially lowered, and people are talking about one in 2,000 or even less. Uh, so as I said, the diagnosis is really no mystery. Uh, we can know what we're dealing with. Typically, when we see it on the hoof, when it comes to the practice, management uh, is what it's all about. And with endothelmitis, I got to emphasize again and again and again and again that uh, prophylaxis, prevention is the key. You really need to try to prevent to, uh, rather than having to deal with the sequel of getting endothelmitis, the less incidence, the less often a patient gets it, the more eyes you're going to be able to save. Because once a patient has had endothelmitis, uh, time is of the essence. Uh, you can manage perfectly well and still get a poor outcome if you have a pretty virulent organism uh, or a bad infection. So we're going to be talking about different aspects of prevention that's been addressed in the literature that we're aware of. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is betadine. And betadine, if I could say, take home message from my talk to anybody, when you think about endothelmitis and endothelmitis prevention, the number one thing I think about is betadine, because betadine has been conclusively proven again and again to be the number one uh, 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 go-to method to prevent endothelmitis. We use 5% betadine or povidone iodine, and it can either be instilled as an eye drop uh, before and after the procedure, or it can be done as a flush. And some people advocate it both ways. If you put in enough uh, amount in an eye drop, I personally do not flush the eye with, with the bovion iodine uh, itself. Timing of application is critical. Uh, sometimes you put a drop in, the patient closes their eye, you walk around, you come back, uh, you, uh, you uh, do some anesthesia, and then you do the injection. Well, it's been proven that the last thing that needs to go on that surface of the eye is the betadine so before, so before you do the injection itself and you try to prevent that eyelid from coming down and closing and touching the, the eye surface before you do the injection. So the eyelid is retracted either by speculum or by fingers, betadine is put in about five to 10 seconds later as a minimum, the injection happens. There are of course people that say they have betadine allergy or iodine allergy. I've had many people come in and say they're allergic to iodine or betadine. I've still used iodine or betadine and there has been no in problems or no reactions. 
I do think that it's way over reported than being actually in, in clinically, but there's also in the literature about using aqueous chlorhexidine, not, not the actual chlorhexidine, which is probably toxic, but an aqueous form of it that can also be preventative and prophylactic for getting uh, endothelmitis. Use of a speculum, we, I typically use a speculum in all my injections. It has traditionally been advocated for use, but there's been some literature uh, series in which uh, has been said that if you have a good assistance and people can help you keep that eyelid open uh, after, after you put in the betadine and before you do the injection, then you get the same results. And that makes sense. It doesn't matter using spectrum as much as keeping those eyelids away from the uh, uh, conjunctival surface. Office versus operating room. In the USA, we mainly use the office. I know in the Middle East that they all often will use the, uh, uh, the operating room. Maybe um, Mohammed, Dr. Ab uh, Mohammed Al Wahab, what do you guys do in these days? Uh, minor OT, Abjad. We are doing in a minor OT, not in a major OT. That's what I thought. We 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 usually do that in our lanes, and we've had really good outcomes with it. There's been a couple of uh, literature uh, publications that have showed there's really no difference in endothelitis from the OR versus the office, and basically you use what you're comfortable with. And when we first started doing these uh, injections, almost everybody used to get antibiotic eye drops, maybe for a day or two before the injection, but definitely three days after the injection. And now we've gone away with that. For the last four or five years, I have not put any patient on uh, preventative or uh, prophylactic antibiotic drops for injections. However, the literature is strongly for using prophylactic intracameral antibiotics in cataract surgery. It has been shown to be effective. And most people use either cephorexime or moxifloxacin in the, uh, in the bag. Use of mask or sterile gloves. Of course, if you're in a minor OR and operating room, you will be using them. In the office, we've gone away from that. Uh, I've, I used masks for a while until the literature showed that just avoiding speaking is just as good. And so that's what we do. We tell the patient we're not gonna be talking to them and we ask them not to talk while the eyelid is being held open after the betadine is put in and before we do the injection. And we have the same results, very low rates of endothelmitis. Uh, and we don't use sterile gloves. We do gloves, but we do not use sterile gloves, and we have not had a problem with that. So there are other issues with prophylaxis, and type of anesthesia has not been proven to decrease the, uh, the endothelmitis rates. You can use subconjunct injection or topical drops or gel, but in gel, be aware that if you put a gel to numb up the eye, you can't use the gel and then put a betadine afterwards because the gel will prevent the betadine from touching the conjunctival surface. So the one exception to the rule is using betadine before the gel or wash out the gel and then use the betadine. Different techniques for prevention of vitreous prolapse have not shown a decreased rate of endothelitis. Scrubbing eyelids and eyelashes with antiseptic solution, again, has not made any difference. And the side of injection, any of the quadrants around the eye doesn't really uh, alter the endothelitis rates. Some practices here in the United States uh, do bilateral same-day injections because of the vo high volume they have. We don't do that routinely in my practice, but it's been proven to not increase the rate of endothelmitis, but you have to be, make sure that you use a different set of instruments and uh, uh, re-glove and uh, do everything as if this patient was coming in for a second visit uh, before doing the injection in the other eye. So we're going to medical management. So now if prevention, you've done all of this and you've cut down the rate of endothelmitis as much as you can, and you still get maybe that one in 5,000, one in 8,000 case of endothelmitis, how do you treat it medically? And we, most of our patients, we treat medically in our office. The seminal trial, the seminal investigation is the endothelmitis detracting study that came out in 1995 and we're all aware of it. And what that endothelmitis detracting study is pointed out is there's no benefit for systemic antibiotics and endothelmitis, exogenous endothelmitis. Immediate vitrectomy is of extra benefit, only light perception, vision or worse. And the vitreous tap and injection done in the office with ceftazidime and amikacin was the antibiotics they used, was just as effective for hand motion, vision and better. Now this study was done in 1995. The main caveat is the only studied post cataract surgery endothelmitis and this was when surgery was done in large gauge. We didn't have small gauge, the perfected techniques that we have these days uh, for vitreoretinal surgery. And we have improved the antibiotics we have available. Both systemic antibiotics and injectables have uh, improved tremendously in efficacy and bioavailability. 
uh, and my colleague who's going to follow me in presentation is going to talk about the surgical aspects of taking care of the endophthalmitis. So back to our case presentation, this patient that walked to my practice uh, one day after giving the ILE injection with kind of fingers of one foot, if we apply the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study criteria to her, then we're going to go ahead and do the tap and inject, which is what was performed in my office. And uh, a quick couple of words about the technique I use. I do a tap with a 3cc syringe, which is you, you're done with a 25 gauge needle in the pars plana. I usually do subconj anesthesia, but if the patient is very sensitive and is very inflamed, sometimes we do retrobulbar anesthesia in the office. We ask for 0.2 cc. Sometimes we get a dry tap and it's really tough to get fluid and you have to reposition the tip of the needle, back up a little bit with it or move it into a different spot in the vitreous cavity. Very gently aspirate. You don't want to create a lot of traction on the vitreous and God forbid, create a retinal tear or detachment. If after two or three attempts, you still have a dry tap, then what we do is we do an AC tap with a tuberculin syringe with a 27 gauge needle. And I usually have an assistant help me to aspirate the fluid from the AC. Don't go after the hypokin material, go after the fluid. And of course you cap the sample, label it, send it to the lab, we, we suspect bacterial, we do a gram stain on culture and sensitivity, but that AC fluid or vitreous fluid can be used to do specific cultures for a fungal or PCR tests if you think this might be a, 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 a part of the differential diagnosis. Nowadays, I inject Vanco and ceftazidime with, these, uh, 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 with that concentrations. I do not typically inject dexamethasone. In penicillin allergies, I substitute amikacin for ceftazidime. And we, I always put them on oral moxifloxacin, which has been proven to have good penetrance into the vitreous cavity and crosses the blood retinal barrier. I give them 400 milligrams PO uh, once daily for 10 days. And I will put them on topical moxifloxacin, Vigamox, and Durazol, Diflopredinate, Hydrox, QID. And if the eye is very inflamed, then I can go up and do result every two hours. That's my steroid of choice, it's topical, not injectable. And then I follow them every day for the next few days. I will ask them about pain. We do the clinical exam for inflammatory signs and we do serial ultrasound B scan to look at the retina and inflammation in the vitreous. If there is no significant improvement in any of the above in the next 48 to 72 hours, then we go ahead with surgical options and we consider doing a vitrectomy. So back to this patient, our patient, our culture was staph epi and thankfully sensitive to vancomycin. And we followed her up daily. Pain resolved over 48 hours. The hypopian fibrosed and the inflammation in the AC resolved over the next week or so. And her visual acuity over a month gradually improved back to 2070. Unfortunately, it didn't get any better because she had diabetic retinopathy, she had an inflamed eye, she got much worse macular edema, and we had to resume her anti vegf and went back on that, and she's doing better today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Amjad, for this excellent presentation. Uh, if there is any question from dear here panelists, uh, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Ramzi, uh, you can unmute yourself, please, all. Dr. Uh, Ahmed Al Barqi, you are here also. Dr. Iman, anyone to want to ask Dr. Amjad about the, his presentation? Dr. Hamad, it's very nice, very good call. So I would like to ask. Uh, after the first injection, if there is no progression, there is no improvement, what's your behavior? Do you do it in the second injection and when, or prefer vitrectomy? So do you believe, do... sorry, do you believe that the second injection, if the first injection is not uh, improve uh, the uh, clinical situation, believe that second injections help or um, do directly vitrectomy? So, so you, typically, typically, typically by the time two or three days have passed, you have the results of the gram stain and hopefully a little preliminary result of the culture. And depending on that, if, if, it is, if it's something that I think is not sensitive to our medication, but sensitive to a different antibiotic, then I will do a secondary injection in the office with the antibiotic it's sensitive to. But if it, I don't have any uh, 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 useful data from the gram stain and culture sensitivity, and the patient is not responding to my uh, tap and inject, then my, I would say 80, 90% of the time, after two, three days, I would go to vitrectomy these days. Yeah. I will not do a second tap and inject. Right. Any other questions, Ahmed, uh, Hassan? 
Yes, Ahmed. So, yeah, just just a quick comment because Dr. Amjad, very nice case, and he mentioned about the uh, the EVS, the uh, endothelial vitrectomy study. And as you mentioned in your uh, talk, that uh, the the situation now or the life now changed after the new uh, small gauge vitrectomy and also the antibiotic systemic antibiotic now has good penetration. So um, uh, my question is: Do you think? Uh, because for me, I, I really don't follow now exactly the EVS. Um, because uh, I think early vitrectomy will help. Because as you mentioned that you take a sample uh, with a 25 gauge needle with a syringe. And you know, all of you know that the endothelmite is the tissue fragile. And while you're aspirating, this, uh, you might create a tear somewhere if the retina is fragile. So I think the best way is to do the tab using now the new 27 gauge vitrectomy. You take it without any traction. You get a lot of uh, big volume if the uh, if the vitreous is not uh, st is dry a little, so you will suffer to get a big sample. So my for myself, I think um, if the patient has counting finger and poor red reflex, personally, I will take direct to the OR and take the sample with the uh, if I have the time and they have the availability. For sure, I will use the 27 gauge vitrectomy probe better than this and uh, for sure we can discuss later about i need also to know the insight from you all about the evs are you still following it exactly or you change your practice nowadays well uh, as i said uh, the the evs has been modified quite a bit i mean the yeah. evs said no systemic antibiotics but i use moxifloxacin so that's that's the deviation from the evs i still use the criteria for uh counting hand motion vision above and below because if I get a, a, somebody that's not hand motions, light perception, definitely a vitrectomy immediately. I still use that criteria. But we, we, we my partners and I, there's, there were three retina specialists in my practice. We do close to eight to 10,000 injections a year. We get one to two endothelmitis every single year, despite everything. We, so we, this is what we treat with. And I would say 90% of our patients, 90%, do very well with tab and inject without going to the OR. The problem with the OR here in the United States is even though I own a surgical center, I, the surgical center is being used. Somebody's doing yeah, cataract yeah. surgery. Yeah. I picked up the phone and called them. Yeah. It's gonna be an hour or two before it's the patient- available all the time, yes, yes. They're in my office. I can do a tab and inject in five minutes. Yeah. So that's why I still do the tab and inject because it works most of the time. Most of the time I don't need to go to the operating room, but, but if they don't respond to the tab and inject, I have a very quick to pull the trigger on a vitrectomy. And I think a vitrectomy is playing more and more a role in management of the tougher in the phthalmitis cases, absolutely. I, I personally have uh, also, even patient with light perception, I tend to go ahead for intravitreal tap and injection before going to the operation room. Uh, I think that that even that time period of 24 hours, maybe schedule it for tomorrow if you don't have a time today. Uh, I think it, it it makes a huge difference intraoperatively dealing with the membrane. Membrane is not so uh, mu mucusy like it, it's more fi it's more uh, fibrous, so it's easier to remove. Uh, and even intraoperatively, the gel, the vitreous, is much easier to vitrectomize. Um, and I think uh, you go a long way starting with intravitreal tap and injection before going to vitrectomy. Makes sense. Uh, I completely Dr. agree with Dr. Hassan. Yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Hassan about uh, even if we uh, plan to do vitrectomy immediately, but it's not possible to do immediately vitrectomy. Therefore, tap and injections uh, is immediately after diagnosis is very important. Uh, even if we plan to do vitrectomy in the same day, so it takes several hours to uh, get available operating room, the other things. So I completely agree that to do uh, tap and injection is as early as possible after diagnosis. That is very important. So I think we all agree about that. Uh, schedule, yeah, procedure. You know, there's yeah. just a new thing came up at the European, uh, uh, the, the European Retina Society that tab and inject results just similar to vitrectomy, and and uh, this is just recently um, uh, published online. Uh, I can share that with you, um, uh, and and I, I don't know. This is just uh, it's not a uh, it's a it's a literature uh, going backward. So it's a, a retrospective review. So a meta, a meta analysis, right? Meta analysis, yeah. A retrospective review uh, and the vitrectomy in Europe. Uh, 
uh, European society talking about how intravitreal tap injects, you know, does just as well with the uh, vitrectomy. No, I, 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 as I said, we, we, it's our go-to method of taking care of our patients initially. Uh, we get excellent results with it 90% of the time. We, we don't need to do a repeat injection or we don't need to do a vitrectomy, but obviously there are patients that are going to need to be more aggressive with and you need to proceed with others so on. But I do believe a vitreous tap and injection is so quick, it's so fast, it's done in the office, we have, even though, like I said, we see people maybe twice a year, we always have in the fridge in our, in our office, we always have this antibiotics ready. They have a two month expiry date. So every two months they're thrown out and we order another uh, antibiotics and they're kept in the fridge, even though we don't use them. And we keep two sets of them just in case, you know, we never had two dethalmitis arrive the same day, but you gotta, you gotta be ready for that. And, and I, I think it's such an easy thing and, and you should be prepared for it. Uh, thank you very much this, for this uh, uh, excellent presentation, Amjad, and very uh, uh, useful I and mean, interactive uh, between the panelists. We have only one question before we move to Dr. Ramzi. Uh, in an angry eye with corneal abscess, cannot tell if vitreous is affected uh, except increased echo via ultrasound. Would you go for intravitreal antibiotic? Because sometimes we cannot tell if it is only cornea or AC or vitritis. Okay, I'm just... So if somebody comes in with a corneal ulcer, they can be a very angry corneal ulcer. They can have a pretty bad anterior chamber reaction and it can look very similar to the picture I showed you with the hypopion. And then it becomes a different, difficult diagnostic uh, 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 issue. I will do the ultrasound. If the ultrasound does show vitreous, uh, uh, a significant vitritis or inflammation of the vitreous, I do tend to towards the tap and inject. I think the ultrasound is my tip off to that because I, I would say this in a corneal ulcer, I would expect and I would think that most of the inflammation would stay in the anterior chamber. If the patient has not had a recent cataract surgery, then there should be a nice barrier from the lens, the PCIOL or the natural lens to prevent that inflammation from really going back to the vitreous. And if I see vitritis, significant vitritis, I, I err on the side of treating as if it's an endothalmitis and do the tap and inject. But I would also, of course, uh, cover the corneal ulcer and treat the corneal ulcer aggressively also. And I would recommend the corneal consultations. I'm not a corneal specialist. I'll make sure the cornea get involved with that case. Uh, thank you very much. Um... Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ramzi Apsi. is an MD professor, consultant of palmic surgeon, head and founder of Retina Eye Hospital, Borsa Tokyo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramzi, for being with us and the mic for you, with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed. So before my talk, I would like to thank Dr. Mohamed for his kind invitation. This is my second uh, duty in uh, his webinar, uh, and I am really uh, appreciate uh, to be here and to be a member of this webinar and share my experience with you. So in my talk, I will speak about the surgical side of endophthalmitis with case presentation. I have no financial disclosure. Uh, the first case is has a medical history 78 years old woman presented to us with complaints of progressive visual loss in the right eye for the past four weeks and she had undergone uh, uncomplicated cataract surgery from the same eye six weeks ago and the complaining start two weeks after the surgery and progressive uh, vision loss progressive versions of the uh, clinical uh, pictures. So uh, in the ocular examination, the vision was counting finger uh, and intraocular pressure was normal, but on the segment, there was three positive uh, cell reaction, but no fibrin reaction and no hypopion and details of the anterior segment was distinguished. And uh, what about the posterior segment? There was severe vitreous uh, condensation. The details were not distinguishable. As you see, here, this picture was taken during surgery. Uh, there was white uh, opaque uh, condensation, also small round uh, ball-like uh, condensation in the cavity. So this is a delay with uh, endophthalmitis. It's not acute uh, endophthalmitis. 
And when we observe this, also this was also uh, visible uh, during the um, uh, biomicroscopic examination. I suspect about uh, fungal amphibolomatis or a kind of low-grade amphibolomatis, and therefore, in this patient, we plan to do a vitrectomy because of the severe condensation. A day after this uh, visit, we plan the surgery, and when we uh, go into the vitro, uh, with surgery to the vitreous cavity, we observe a very typical finding of fungal amphibolomatis after core vitrectomy. Uh, as you see, has really a severe condensation. We observe many small fluffy uh, balls overlying the retina. Uh, this is really uh, typical for fungal endophthalmitis. The patient has no systemic uh, problem. Uh, then uh, we, in, in such case, I have really not huge experience with fungal endophthalmitis, but um, I plan to clean all uh, balls, all condensations, to reduce the spore load in the vitreous cavity and to get a, uh, to be able to treat uh, patients easily. And then uh, with, with giving time and clean all the balls, uh, not on the posterior pole, also in the, on the periphery. And also I prefer to do complete vitrectomy and clean all the vitreous space. So in such patient, uh, I think this is important to uh, reduce the, uh, uh, spores uh, load in the vitreous cavity. So with, with indentation also complete uh, vitreous based cleaning we performed, but the retina was not any uh, toxic effect on the retina, macular area was fine. And then we apply fluid air exchange three to two times to clean the rest of uh, condensations and clean vitreous completely. And then uh, during this uh, surgery, we send the samples uh, to the laboratory to make his wet mount uh, per, uh, looking. And this is the end of the surgery. And the culture was negative after surgery in this patient, but wet mount preparation and uh, they observe uh, candidate spores and uh, we apply intravitreal uh, uh, uh injections. And also we gave systemic uh, fluconazole treatment this patient. And this picture was four weeks after surgery. As you see, retina is completely um, recovered and there is no recurrence. And we, the patient did not need second intravitreal injection. The systemic treatment was, uh, we gave two weeks uh, for two weeks, uh, fluconazole treatment. Also, uh, topical uh, steroids we uh, apply uh, these patients. Also, topical antibiotics for the, sec uh, the for the uh, secondary infections. This is the OCT pictures and the patient vision improved to 2020 uh, after this uh, surgery. And I follow this patient almost more than three years. There is no recurrence, and still the patient has saved the same vision. So, in summary, for fungal endothelitis, the diagnosis of fungal endothelitis is based on eye findings rather than vitreous culture and spores can be seen by wet mount preparation of vitreous samples and uh, systemic treatment is necessary in fungal endophthalmitis as opposed to bacterial endophthalmitis. Uh, in usually bacterial endophthalmitis, I do not use systemic treatment. Dr. Hamad mentioned about the systemic uh, moxifloxacin treatment is another option, but usually I prefer intravitreal injection and topical treatments. But in fungal endophthalmitis, this is important. We should give uh, systemic treatment or even Almost, uh, also in most of the uh, fungal endothelitis, if there is only uh, choreotonitis, if there is no vitreous uh, condensation, there is, it's not uh, like a choreotonitis, it's not the typical endothelitis, we may treat this patient with only systemic treatment also. So complete uh, vitrectomy and pa uh, uh, patient clinic, all opacities is important to reduce spores load in the vitreous cavity and to get uh, successful results. So this is my way uh, to treat endophthalm fungal endophthalmitis. But as I told you before, I have not um, many experience. I have a few cases. Uh, one of them is this case. And I apply this surgery then if, uh, two or three cases more. And also we get uh, good results. So maybe uh, the second case is with bacterial endophthalmitis, uh, Mohammed. Uh, if you want, we can discuss this fungal endothelitis yes, with our colleagues and also continue the second surgery.
Yeah, if you can have any, any question from my dear here colleagues, Hassan or Amjad or Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Iman, and you want to ask Dr. Ramzi about the case or have any question to Dr. Ramzi? I, I usually comment. I of an um, conservative regarding doing shaving uh, for any endophthalmitis cases, just in case I end up, uh, you know, having a tear or a hole or something, because that kind of makes it a different animal when you have an endophthalmitis and a retinal detachment. And I, it'd be really nice not to need to use a, a, a tamponade or uh, like a gas or silicone oil. So I kind of tend not to shave if possible. And I mean, in some instances where they're really severe uh, trocar incarceration or cannula incarceration, then I would. I would probably do it, but I'm more kind of do a conservative vitrectomy and then uh, just put my antibiotics and that's all. You mean, so, uh, you mean uh, Hassan, you don't remove all the opacities as Dr. Ramsey, if in case we are now talking, I mean, specifically about the candida uh, infection, I mean. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about the peripheral vitreous, um, I, I vitreous based shaving. I, I, that's my approach usually. But uh, okay. if you speak about the bacterial endophthalmitis, it's virulent bacterial endophthalmitis. I agree with you to not to do complete vitrectomy. Even sometimes we, I don't uh, uh, remove the posterior hyaloid. It's very uh, fragile retina, very ischemic and toxic uh, effect on the retina. But if we speak about the fungal endophthalmitis, so this is different way. So uh, in fungal endophthalmitis, if, it's there, if there is no... Uh, retinal defect, if there is no retinal toxic effect on the retina, if there is no retinitis, chorioretinitis, we, I uh, pay attention to remove all the vitreous as much as possible. Uh, but fungal ophthalmitis is different behavior and comparing the bacteria and the ophthalmitis. Good point. Amjad, if you have any comment, please. Are you talking to me, Muhammad? Yeah, if you have any comment or... I, or I think it's a beautiful case. I applaud Dr. Ramsey. I think he did a really nice job with it. Those, those are really hard cases. I mean, they really are hard cases. And, and I agree with Dr. Hassan that you kind of, you want to do a minimal touch usually with endophthalmitis. You really try to be very minimal touch with those. But, but if you have a really bad fungal, uh, then you got to try to uh, 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 remove as much as possible. Uh, we, we've had cases uh, where we've done this in combination uh, with anterior segment people where we've, we've gone up all and then to enter the, 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 uh, the far periphery and go up to what, uh, to all the way up to the ciliary body and actually shave around the ciliary body because there's thick adhesions up there, almost like very thick anterior PBR. They can sometimes have anterior loops and you have to try to get rid of those sometimes just to uh, get rid of the, uh, the, the fungal spores, get rid of the fungal material. And uh, I remember one case in which uh, the, it was uh, a fungal endothelmitis from a corneal uh, ulcer, a fungal corneal ulcer. And, and uh, the, the part about that is the cornea had to be removed. We had to put a keratoprosthesis and work under a keratoprosthesis to try to take the fungal material that had crawled from the cornea back, cover the, the ciliary body and go into the retina and vitreous cavity. And that was a really messy case. That took a few hours. So uh, this is not easy, but, uh, but uh, Dr. Ramsey, I think you did a fantastic job with that one. I, I have two questions, Dr. Ramsey, for you. you. This is from a participant. Should we, um, okay, we'll answer this. Should we start with intravitreal antifungal before vitrectomy, or the moment there was vitritis, then surgery is the, uh, is the answer? I mean, what is the criteria to go for? If we can answer, ask in this question, what is the criteria that tell you to go for surgical intervention rather than treat as medically for fungal uh, infection? So the in, fungal. The, in fungal endophthalmitis, it's not like bacterial uh, virulent endophthalmitis. It's like uh, low-grade and delayed endophthalmitis. And, and also, uh, my uh, few experience with the same with the patients, and I really um, uh, try to com completely clean the vitreous space, uh, vitreous uh, uh, condensations. And uh, I believe that uh, if we do not do this, and uh, we can do injection maybe, but uh, injection, uh, antifungal injection in the vitreous cavity with condensed uh, vitreous is not really helps. And therefore, we 
should um, uh, remove all the vitreous, all the condensation, and do the injection at the same period. So, uh, usually I prefer to do a vitrectomy and clean all the vitreous and then give injection. Uh, do not wait, uh, inter uh, anti fungal injection, wait a few days, just go directly vitrectomy. Uh, anyway, this question also is answered by dear my brother, Dr. Hassan. Sorry that I, I didn't notice that, Hassan. You already answered the question by sending a, an answer. Um, anyway, we can have the second case. Um, we have uh, many questions for Dr. Amjan and Dr. Ramzi. Maybe after we finish the second case, then we have the all the other balance questions. Is that okay? Okay, can we go, Dr. Hassan, uh, Dr. Ramzi, now for the second case? Please. So this is another patient with 88 years old. Man referred to us with complaint of severe pain, visual loss, and redness in the right eye after uh, for six days. And uh, she had um, uncomplicated cataract surgery from the same eye three weeks ago. And the uh, uh, complaint starts almost uh, a week after, uh, two weeks after uh, surgery. And in you know, ocular examination, uh, the vascular activity, visual activity was 120. And anterior segment has hemorrhage, uh, fibrin reaction, also hypopion. And uh, we applied uh, vitreous step and intravitreal uh, injection same day immediately after diagnosis and uh, follow the patients. And uh, during the four days, the, uh, the, we observed the improvement of the patients, uh, but not the visually improvement, only the hypopion and the fibrin reaction regress but there are still severe uh, vitreous condensation and therefore uh, I plan to do a vitrectomy this patient. And uh, this is the uh, surgery. Uh, as you see again, there was really uh, condensation. So uh, we applied delay vitrectomy uh, after injection if the vitreous is uh, has really con say, severe condensation like in these patients because in this in such patient it's not really uh, uh, see the cleaning of the vitreous uh, for it uh, takes for a long period of time to completely clean and therefore uh, even uh, we uh, get positive answer for the injection in this uh, massive case I prefer vitrectomy so after vitrectomy also uh, there was some uh, fluffy uh, materials overlying the retina. But in this patient, I did not uh, clean complete the vitreous base, but again, this was not really a attached hyaluronic. There is no retinal toxicity, and therefore I do uh, core vitrectomy as much as possible and uh, clean the vitreous, but not complete cleaning of the vitreous base. So in such patient, uh, I prefer, just after surgery, I prefer uh, to do a 360 degree uh, laser around the periphery to prevent potential uh, retinal tear and uh, retinal detachment complication. So uh, as you see, this is the picture. So these are both cases of my patient is not really massive case. There is no uh, bacterial to and the toxin toxicity on the retina and apply the laser. So uh, did not give any um, uh, tamponade materials. So clean also vitreous, the anterior segment uh, of the patients. So the microbiological results and the gray positive coagulous negative stuff uh, appear was the, uh, in our uh, patients. So in uh, summary, uh, vitreous step and intravitreal antibiotics injection should be initiated immediately after the clinical diagnosis of bacterial and Hello, Dr. Ramzi, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Hassan, Amjad, are you hearing Dr. Ramzi? No, we can't hear Dr. Ramzi. I think I think there is some interruption in his uh, I think he internet. Is, uh, internet issues, yes. Ah, uh, he's now yeah. here again. Oh, there he is. It's okay? Yeah, we can see you now, Dr. Ramzi. Can we go back or you just stop here? Uh, no, because already we lost you for two minutes. Okay. We didn't listen to you. In the, you okay. can give us only the after the after the the videos. Just start from the videos. The result and the yeah, the uh, macrovisual result. We uh, stuff AB was uh, and our uh, culture uh, 
as Clog does negative uh, bacteria. And um, so uh, in this patient also, we did not uh, give another injection uh, and just topical treatment, steroids and antibiotic treatments after surgery, and we obtained complete recovery. So in summary, in bacterial endophthalmitis, vitreous step and intravitreal antibiotic injection should be initiated immediately after the clinical diagnosis of bacterial endophthalmitis, even if we plan the vitrectomy, as I, we discussed before, uh, because vitrectomy takes, uh, to do vitrectomy takes several times in the busy day and uh, operating is not available. And therefore I do uh, in, with, uh, injection as immediately after diagnosis. And if there is no improvement with uh, 12, 48 hours after the injection in culture negative patients, I prefer to do vitrectomy uh, instead of to do second injection in this patient, as also we discussed this uh, together with, uh, with uh, in the previous talks. And also, even if there is a clinical improvement, vitrectomy can be performed to clean uh, to clear vitreous opacities uh, later as a delayed vitrectomies. So this is the uh, end of my uh, second case. We can discuss uh, also if you- Thank you very much, Dr. Ramzi. An excellent presentation, excellent cases. Excellent management also. Uh, we learn also a lot. So we, there is a lot of debate, I know. There is many different ways for dealing, uh, but already we talk about several points that we discussed. Uh, we will answer several questions unless there is, before that, if there is any comment from any one of the panelists, Dr. Hassan, Amjad, Ahmed, and Dr. Iman, if there is any comment, Dr. Ahmed, please, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, just just uh, just to go with the flow, uh, uh, I agree totally that you know uh, with Dr. Hassan and Dr. Ramzi that there is some debate between doing complete vitrectomy or just cool vitrectomy endophthalmitis, and don't do a lot of manipulation to avoid any uh, tear or hole in the peripheral retina. So uh, I believe the best way to do that, if you can, you can decide intraoperatively. As you see, it's, it's not, endophthalmitis are not the same. You have some cases that's mild. I mean, no traction, no adhesion, but sometimes also you have very difficult cases. So in those cases, if you dig digging and trying to remove all the membrane, you might end up with something. But the best thing is to do, if you can, is to do, you remove the tectum as much as you can, because the more you remove the mobitrous cavity, the more you remove the tex endotoxins and bacteria, which is the most uh, toxic effect on the retina. So I think and, uh, uh, we shouldn't stick to one uh, certain technique. Uh, it depends on the case. If the case is going easy, like if endosalmite uh, fungal, the Dr. Ramsey show, it was, uh, it's okay. Some people, for example, decide to do or insist to doing BVD, for example, in some cases, which is very, it could be very dangerous in those cases, but sometimes you can peel it easily. So you put, because you put in our mind that we remove as much as vitreous as we can, if allows us, the situation allows us. If not, just do a vitrectum and do in the, in, injection anti, anti, antibiotics or whatever, and then uh, uh, definitely it will be best result if you complete, uh, complete vitrectomy. That's my, uh, my comment. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Any other comments? Past yeah, comments? I totally agree. And one, one really important point uh, Dr. Ramsey mentioned in his video, maybe uh, people will kind of not... And notice, but the fluid air exchange is is very important that Dr. Ramsey did, and I do that uh, multiple occasions, uh, four or five times as much as possible, because that really helps clean all the vitreous, all the, uh, I mean, you know, all around the ciliary body. Uh, so that's one, just one point I wanted to um, point uh, out. Thank you, Great. Hassan. Any thank comment, you. Amjad or Dr. Iman? Anyone want to comment, please? I, I, uh, think, it's, I think it's said it all. Okay, so we have uh, uh, a few questions. We want to answer that before we move to uh, our, my dear friend, Hassan. Um, but we need a very fast answer as short as possible. Uh, also, this is what about use of steroid concomitantly with antibiotics? Uh, this is Amjad for you when you are doing, I mean. Uh, I only give stories topically, not intravitreal stories, Mohammed. Uh, I give topical stories after uh, surgery or also uh, after injection, uh, okay. start such stories, but not, not uh, intravitreal. Yeah, because Dr. Ramzi, before we, when we are used to do, when we are uh, giving as a management of uh, um, I mean, endophthalmitis, we are giving three antibiotics, then we are giving uh, uh, also a steroid dexamethasone before this era. Yeah. Now, I don't think uh, this anymore is applicable, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I personally I personally use uh, both Vang, Ceftazidine, and Decadron, dexamethasone injection. 
you are still Hassan. using that mean still you are using Hassan the, the yes, yeah. I, yes I mean in intravitreal you are injected yes I inject three oh. things and I so because uh, this is also a debate some people they are not uh, anywhere giving I, some I, I, I think I I think it's very debatable and I used to like Dr. Hassan do the intravitreal injections of steroids but uh, with the uh, with the newer uh, topical steroids, especially with the use of Derzol, uh, yeah. I've found it to, to be quite effective, and I I don't I don't have to worry about making things worse with a steroid injection. But again, that's all theory; it's all debatable, and uh, I have no problem with, uh, with with doing the injections the way Dr. Hassan does. Yeah, I mean, I... Derzol is probably just as strong as the intravitreal. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we don't have that. Um, you know, uh, like, if okay. we. Sorry, if I yeah, see that here. there is really a severe fibrin reaction that we need some anti-inflammatory treatment, I prefer to do subtenon uh, steroids instead of intravitreal uh, Hassan together with topical steroids. But so this is my experience. Maybe maybe uh, you can be right, but uh, intravitreal steroids that did not make sense in my cases, and I tried that. But so as you say, this is very debatable uh, topics. Uh, okay, there is a question from my dear friend, uh, Dr. He's a VR vitreoretina, well known vitreoretina surgeon in Sudan, uh, Dr. Babaker. His, his question is New way we can do uh, a vitreal tab using 23 gauge uh, trockers. And his second question Would you, uh, uh, would injection increase chance to introduce? Uh, no, this is another question for a different person. Okay, uh, any comment about this one? Um, so go ahead, Dr. Yeah, I'm so, uh, actually, if if possible, I would try to do uh, to take vitreous samples with a 27 gauge trocker. This is much safer comparing the uh, aspiration. So, but it's not it's not uh, possible uh, the uh, uh, all the times the busy day operating room is not uh, available. And if but if possible, I prefer to use a 27 gauge trocker. Because insertion of trocar is pain for the patient, but then if there's no pain, you can get direct vitreous cavity and you can take vitreous as uh, much as possible. And uh, this is also uh, much safer without uh, with uh, about the retinal detachment and tractions. But it's not always possible, as uh, Dr. Uh, Hamad also mentioned that the same things. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Ramzi and Amjad uh, or Hassan or Ahmed. Uh, 25 when you are doing this one you are doing at the same time a vitrectomy or you are only doing but just to take the tab and go out so if if i uh, do not plan to do vitrectomy i just do tap and give injections and stop uh, but if okay. i if they plan to do vitrectomy i can continue but uh, not all uh, not all the times uh, then another question would injection increase chance to introduce microbes posteriorly so, would it, sorry, it, could, would, yeah, Hassan, go ahead. Dr. Yeah, Hamad. Just, please go, I'm just, please go ahead. Yeah. I'm just. So, uh, if, if, you, if you're doing it, this is a patient that already has an infection, so I wouldn't be worried about causing an infection. And we're injecting antibiotics into the eye. So, I mean, if you're injecting an actual antimicrobial agent, the chances of introducing additional microbes is extremely small. And I, I again, it's, it's, we, I do, when I do a tap and inject, I do the, the typical, uh, pre-injection protocol where I, you know, I use the betadine, I use the speculum, I make sure everything is nice as sterile as possible in, in environment, and you do what you can do with a regular injection. And so uh, uh, there's always a possibility of, you know, uh, 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 but, I don't, but in, in a patient that already has an infection, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, I mean, so the, way, the, risk and benefit, the risk and benefit is just much higher benefit over the risk. So you have to go with that. Yeah. Okay, so we are running behind the time also. We are, I need a very fast and Yanni, only in one few seconds answer this question. When exactly you start the steroid? Uh, I mean, immediately after diagnosis of endophthalmitis or 24 hours after initiation of antibiotic. So we do topical drops and at the time of diagnosis, you do a tap, inject and send them home with a topical steroid. Excellent. Now it's Same. my time to... Yeah. So yeah. Hassan, you are ready now to uh, yeah yeah well, yeah. Doctor Hassan is my dear friend. Also, Hassan Bahrani is an MD, retinal specialist, a medical director of American Eye and Retina Center, Erbil, Iraq. Uh, Hassan, my pleasure to be with us. Thank Thanks you for coming. And please go ahead, Mike, with you. 
Okay, so thanks, uh, Dr. Al Omari, for the kind invitation. Uh, thanks for the other sh other speakers to share the podium. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, cataract uh, uh, and posterior segment complication in cataract surgery. Um, so my talk is going to be short, uh, nice. Uh, cataract surgery is, uh, you know, one of the most successful surgical procedure we perform. However, complications can be really, um, really devastating, not only for the patient, but also for the physicians. And com complications can be taken care of if recognized early and taken care of immediately. So no one, I mean, there's, I mean, there's no, if somebody doesn't want complication, then they should stop doing surgery. We will all face complications and therefore, it's the way you manage the complication that matters. It's not that you have uh, complications. So there are five major posterior segment complications of cataract surgery. And those are the, there are much more, but the, these are the five major ones. The retained lens fragment, we have postoperative endophthalmitis, which Dr. Hamad, Dr. Afshi has sp spoke about. We have retinal detachment, CME, and subluxated or dropped IOL. Today, I'm going to be talking only about the first, uh, the, the retained or dropped lens fragments because of the time. So the retained lens fragment is in, uh, in late term dropped lens. Uh, it can be as high as 1% in, 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 in people who would experience hands. However, it can be higher in residents and, and new, uh, new graduates. The risk, of, uh, risk factors for retained lens fragment are mainly limited pupil dilation, traumatic cataract, patient movement during surgery. So that's why good akinesia during surgery is very important. Not just good a anesthesia, but also good akinesia. Also pseudo exfoliation and Marfan syndrome. Uh, I think in our population in Iraq, we do see a lot of pseudo exfoliation because of the exposure to the sun, the heat, and that is a very uh, problematic uh, thing for our population. Again, so what are the, the primary ocular effects when we get the retained lens fragment? So the mainly we're talking about two major things, the inflammation and the intraocular pressure. So the degree of the, the inflammation and intraocular pressure is usually proportional to the size of the lens fragment. Typically a cortical remnant, uh, it can be small, but it hydrates usually post-operative uh, days. So the retina specialist will look into the eye and assess the, the size of the cortical remnant. And that's important to determine whether the, the surgeon will go into observation or do vitrectomy. As far as, the, as far as the retained nuclear material, usually it's associated with higher degree of inflammation and higher IOP. And usually the reason for the higher IOP is because of the liberated lens proteins and macrophages uh, disrupting the trabecular meshwork. So if you don't treat it uh, appropriately, then those would most likely go to peripheral anterior sinica and chronic angle closure uh, glaucoma. So what if you get a retained lens fragment uh, intraoperatively, what to do? I mean, the most important thing is you should not attempt to retrieve the lens fragment from the vitreous cavity. Uh, that's, uh, that's a definitely a no. And, and, and kind of you're, you're kind of apprehensive intraoperatively and you wanna go get it and you're worried about speaking to the patient postoperatively. Uh, and that's, you know, you should just tell yourself, no, I mean, don't do it. So these, these uh, maybe aggressive maneuvers can lead to vitreous traction uh, and also getting a horseshoe tear and ending up in a retinal detachment. So instead of fixing the problem, you're actually making it worse. You're digging up a, a hole for yourself. And ag again, also a limited anterior vitrectomy should be done and removal of the cortical material in the anterior segment also should be performed make sure to kind of sweep the anterior chamber for any remnant of the vitreous or vitreous uh, wicks, as we may say it, that may go to the anterior chamber and to the paracentesis incisions. And therefore it's really important to use uh, maybe anterior chamber kenicord or triamcinolone to uh, delineate the vitreous strands. Again, this is a very important point. The third one is you have to really 
put an IOL only if you are absolutely sure there is a good sulcus. So uh, in the past, uh, in the U.S., people, a lot of people use, still use ACIOL, but I really tend not to um, want to use ACIOL, and I uh, recently never use ACIOL. So sulcus IOL can be implanted if you're really sure, and there's there's an, a good sulcus without a without compromise of the sulcus, then go ahead and put a three piece IOL. Don't put a one piece IOL because that would cause uh, future uh, iris pigments shaving, cause you uh, uveitis and issues like that, UVH syndrome. Uh, so I'm really, I'm really into leaving the patient aphakic uh, because that kind of makes the retina specials job much easier. I know it's really tough to tell the patient you didn't implant an IOL uh, intraoperative, but uh, I think that's uh, that makes the final outcome better and easier and complicates the case less for the retina specials. A silicon uh, based IOL should be uh, avoided because of the potential problem when we operate as retina specialists because it causes uh, very uh, dense fogging uh, du during fluid air exchange. Again, and I cannot stress that enough, corneal incision. I know you're kind of scared and you got a retained lens fragment, a dropped lens, and you just want to get out of the operation room and go to the, your next case maybe, but please do take care of the um, corneal incision. Make sure your, uh, your paracentesis incision, your keratome incision are very watertight because the last thing you want is to have on top of what you already have, you have an endophthalmitis. And I've seen a lot of cases where, uh, you know, I see patient drop lens and then endophthalmitis. And as soon as I'm, you know, I'm trying, I haven't even put the trocars and I see leakage uh, from the interior chamber. So that's a very important point. So post-operative management, frequent topical steroids, usually every hour, cycloplegia, IOP lowering medications, full IOP management. I put them on even uh, acetazolamide Damox. Even if the pressure is uh, in the teens and 20s, I usually put them on all uh, IOP lowering medications. And I found that to be helpful, not only to prevent the spike of IOP, but also to uh, facilitate corneal edema. Also, I ask the interior segment specialist to put the patient on natrosalt uh, drops and an ointment to help uh, speed uh, the recovery of the cornea. And of course, prompt referral to a vitro retinal surgeon. That is really highly recommended because I know some docs do kind of try to uh, say, oh, I just dropped the cortical material. Maybe it's not that important. I think it will resolve, but I think it's really a good uh, practice to prompt prefer uh, these cases. As far as uh, observation versus vitrectomy, uh, you know, most cases do need require, uh, from my experience, require vitrectomy for these cases, but only in minimal, in few cases where you have minimal cortical material and controlled inflammation and IOP, maybe you could consider uh, observation. When situation when you have high IOP or inflammation, then you should you should go ahead for vitrectomy lensectomy. In almost all cases of retained nuclear material, uh, you should go ahead and for vitrectomy and lensectomy and kind of try to assess intraoperative what dropped, you know, because I always speak to an interior segment. Oh, I just dropped a very minimal piece of cortical, and then when I go intraoperatively. I, I find the whole nucle the, the whole nucleus or the whole lens. So that kind of helps me prior to vitrectomy surgeries to kind of have a plan, <laughs> whether I'm going to use the vitrectory alone, whether I'm going to do a cut down incision and do a, a sclerotomy and, and use a fragmentome, 20 gauge fragmentome. So that's kind of helpful. Uh, if you have a whole crystalline lens dropped, then th those do not require immediate treatment. And because they, they, the, the, the capsule is intact and you will not have uh, inflammatory response as, uh, as, a, as, a, as the other uh, drop lens. So the timing of the surgery, usually there's little evidence in the literature that suggests that you should operate on the same day uh, or is associated with a better uh, outcome. 
So uh, what I usually do, I put them, put the patient on multiple medications and try to operate within the uh, first two weeks, usually around 14 days or so. And that kind of gives me uh, time to help the cornea clear uh, uh, and get the medications in. So in long-term complications, we have retinal detachment. And, and, and those detachment, if those occurs, and they, in my experience, they end up going to severe PVR. So you try to avoid having a retinal detachment intraoperatively or postoperatively. Uh, also, progression of diabetes is common in these patients. So when I have patients who are diabetic and have retained lens fragment, I usually go ahead and do some live PRP intraoperatively. Prognosis is pretty good. And overall, uh, most final visual acuity 2040 or better uh, achieved in 44% of patients. Those patients that did not improve over the 44% uh, usually had a pre-existing ocular condition such as corneal edema, CME, and retinal detachment. So you can have a very good prognosis uh, in cases if you manage it appropriately. This is, I'm gonna share with you a case where uh, this patient uh, had uh, a, a drop lens early on in the surgery. And what was the, the great thing about what this anterior segment surgeon did is he pretty much just closed the closed and left it for the vitro retinal surgeon. You see my cornea is clear. I can go ahead and implant an IOL. And this is debatable. I This is my technique where I put the lens first. Uh, but uh, usually it's really nice because that, that docs didn't try to uh, intervene uh, and dig themselves up. Um, so in this case is make sure to close the, uh, the incision very well. And then here I'm doing a uh, lensectomy. I'm doing a cortical removal. You see, we have the whole lens drop. I think that that lens dropped during uh, initial grooving of the lens. And here I'm removing the cortical material posteriorly. Uh, I have a well-centered uh, sulcus IOL. And then I usually try to remove the vitreous first. And that's very, very important where you have to remove the vitreous before you attack that lens. So you go ahead and then do the uh, lensectomy for the cortical material. And then lastly, you go for the nuclear. And uh, thank God, luckily, this, uh, this lens, uh, was I was able to remove it, use a 20, 25 gauge, and I didn't need to go to fragmentome. So um, I always do uh, an endo laser for any suspicious area. I shave, because especially inferiorly, uh, to remove any remnant uh, cor uh, cortical lens material there. And uh, you usually can have a good result. And this, this patient didn't require tamponade because uh, uh, the retina was fine. And uh, I did intracameral Vigamox here. And then the, the case was done. This patient uh, did very well and uh, achieved a, a visual acuity of 2040. So the key points in retained lens fragment is to restrain on the part of the cataract surgeon to remove lens fragments from the vitreous cavity, aggressive treatment of inflammation and IOP, timely referral to vitro retinal surgeons, and can, good visual outcome can be achieved if proper interoperative postoperative management. Thank you. So this is, we're not going to go on to the end of the Thank line. you very much, uh, Thank you. Hassan, for this uh, excellent presentation. It's really, uh, you, you take all uh, us in different way and you collect all the information that we need to hear from you. I know it take, uh, it's, it's done in a few days that I inform you. It's not uh, what you prepared it very well. Uh, I think there's a question from Dr. Ahmed al -Bakri. I know he will uh, comment about these cases exactly. Why? <laughs> no, just... I know you, Ahmed, because uh, you are no. having a good experience. But my question to Hassan, before my dear Ahmed, if you want to ask, uh, if you are a vitreotinal surgeon and the drop mucus happened with you, so are you going to do it at the same time or you are going to keep it as usual or so one week or four days, three days? <laughs> it can happen with the vitreotinal. Yeah, I, 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 it happens to me and I go ahead and do it right away. Okay. 
So uh, what is the, the minimum time and maximum time that we need to do this surgery? It's according to the, the if it is drop a whole nucleus is completely, or if it is apart, uh, it make a difference. There is one question also, uh, if there is a, a very small uh, uh, lens fragment inside the vitreous or and not on the macula itself away, far away, are you going to keep it? Is there a possibility to keep it, not to do the surgery at all, not to remove it? Not to remove the lens? No, is that there, is, if there is a very small fragment in the eye of the lens, and it is there and away from the macula. Well, if it, as I mentioned, if it's a nuclear material, uh, then, you know, uh, then it's probably need to have a vitrectomy, especially with the, you know, uh, minimal invasive, I would say, vitrectomy surgery, I think uh, I wouldn't want to have that nucleus in my eye if, if that was me. So, I mean, you would end up with having some chronic uveitis, and I have many patients who end up with the, with this kind of uh, issues, and then from looking at the eye and looking at the posterior capsule, it's not an intact posterior capsule, and I knew there's some kind of drop lens somewhere that was not mentioned. So that means we are have to do the surgery, whatever the, uh, the the size of the nucleus drop in the eye, wherever it is, right? I uh, I think if it's a nuclear material, I I would suggest uh, operating. Yeah, but sometimes you how can you differentiate? It is easy sometimes not to differentiate if it is only a cortical or part of nucleus. Well, that's what I said. The the physician or the anterior segment specialist should give us some information as to. What happened intraoperatively? That's number one. Sometimes examination uh, in the in the clinic can provide some useful information as to whether to operate or not. And also, looking from the inflammation and from the IOP, that can give us a, a clue as to what happened or the amount of material that is actually in there. If you have a, a spike of IOP, if you have a like an angry looking eye, uh, this tells you there's more than just a small piece of nucleus. Okay, uh, any other comment from dear, dear colleagues? Ahmed, Amjad, Dr. Ramzi, Dr. Uh, Iman? Hassan, uh, this is great. So may, uh, this is great uh, talk, also your uh, case. I just uh, want to say something about your surgical technique. So you prefer to do a intraocular lens before we check to me. So uh, what what do you aim? Why you did like this? Because yeah. not in all cases, but in some cases we have very hard nucleus, hard drop cataracts and dropped in the vitreous cavity. And in this patient, in my uh, technique, I prefer to uh, eat the hard drop cataract uh, with the filling of the vitreous cavity completely with PFCL and to take the float uh, cataract uh, on the post, uh, on the, behind the uh, iris on the no original position, then do standard anterior segment FACO. In heart rock cataract, this is the, I think this is the safest way and time saving way to remove the heart rock cataract with standard FACO uh, instead of FACO fragmentation because in FACO fragmentation, it takes a lot of time, it's traumatized and uh, increased inflammation. So in such patient, I think to do a vitrectomy to remove the lens first, then make oil implantation is better. So. Uh, therefore, what was your aim? Why you prefer uh, IOL implantation at the beginning of surgery? Uh, I really wonder what was the... Uh, yeah, I, I actually given us a, a talk about this. Uh, this is, uh, I have been doing this for many years, actually. And that's my way to go uh, technique, especially uh, in most uh, drop lenses, and especially also in traumatic cataract, where you have... Um, I mean, in this case, in this case, the sulcus was very nice, but most of the time you don't have a good sulcus and you have some issues. But I found out that when you do this, it actually makes your IOL very, much, very stable. I mean, imagine you're doing FACO and you have an open posterior segment. It's really tough. And then you end up you know, I mean, you're doing FACO and then the lens drop and then you have to go vitrectomy and then you have to go back up. So in my case, uh, I draw, uh, I have, you really never had an issue. And I, I have usually easy going with the uh, fragmentome in cases where there's hard lenses. 
so, but the main thing I found in my experience is that the stability of the lens, when you place it before you remove the, the lens uh, material is, 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 is amazing. And I have usually, uh, and, and then also uh, think about the, uh, the res you know, having introducing phaco again, the, 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 the cornea is already um, edematous and then the endothelium already hydrated. So in this case, if you know, uh, my corneal clarity remained the same during the entire procedure because what I did, as soon as I put the lens, I divided the anterior segment from the posterior segment and I don't have any corneal endothelium hydration. And in that way, I kind of say, uh, you know, I could do, you know, an hour, two hour surgery, it's fine. But I used to do that technique where I introduced the phaco and then do the, the lensectomy uh, and the iris plane. But I found the cornea to be hazy and then I have to do vitrectomy. And in some cases, as you, as you are, uh, as you know, and all of us know, sometimes these patients have retinal detachment case uh, along with the drop lenses because of the aggressive manipulation and stuff. And you won't really have sometimes success of the uh, vitrectomy just in, doesn't depends on the person, depends on the cornea clarity because how much you can do uh, inside the eye. So I think this is a good way to keep the IOL very much stable, uh, to also keep your cornea clear. And I think uh, if, if you have an issue with eating that with a, the, with a small 25 gauge or 23 gauge, then a fragmentome um, should do. So, I mean- Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, I know that you have present one presentation about these topics with us in Al Qasim Family International Conference. So, but it will take a long time to explain. So we are not having any time and you already take 22 minutes, not 10 minutes as you tell Dr. Ahmed al <laughs> uh, So now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Iman uh, al Abdul Latif, MD, Univitis Consultant, Lecturer of Palmology Alexandria, uh, University Egypt. Uh, Dr. Iman, please you can share your, and start having, giving us your lectures. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. Okay, if you can share your screen, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. A pleasure to be here with my uh, colleagues and uh, uh, both the speakers and attendants, and uh, uh, always an honor to uh, participate with you. Uh, we shall give a simplified approach to the etiology of uh, cases of retinal vasculitis. This is uh, part of the, um, the result or the conclusion of our Egyptian experience uh, for the past uh, decade or so. Um, to reach the cause of vasculitis, we uh, will specify the case according to five points. Uh, what we used to do uh, years before is to refer these cases of vasculitis to the internist or dermatologist uh, to look for a cause among um, uh, dozens of causes and usually he does not uh, come up with the specific cause because of the uh, very long list of possible causes and you know uh, it's very difficult to find something uh, you don't really uh, know so instead of saying uh, for your kind care, for systemic workup and so on, let's see how the ophthalmologist can really reach the cause and treat it quite perfectly. You specify the case according to five points. Number one is the type of vessel affected. Certain diseases tend to affect the arteries, others tend to affect the veins, and a third group affects both the arteries and the veins. The whole approach depends on a solid concept in pathology known as tropism. Just as the green plant um, bends towards the light, bends towards water, bends towards the gravity, also each disease has a target that it is directed to each. For example, when I get a prick with the hepatitis C virus, I do not get the disease in my finger it goes to my liver because it has receptors that call for it. Likewise, every disease 
knows its target and its target calls for it. When you get a case of vasculitis in which the arteries are the main type of vessel affected, these are your VIPs. These are the top of the list causes, at least in Egypt, systemic lupus, erythematosus, polyarthritis, nodosa, syphilis, which is resurging and herpes viridi, both the simplex and the zoster. On the other hand, if the veins are affected, sarcoidosis, Bechet's disease, and Birchot retinochoridopathy. A third group of causes tends to affect both the arteries and the veins, and by arthritis and phlebitis, we mean combined artery and vein inflammation in the same eye. Look for MS, toxoplasmosis, and Wegener's granulomatosis. The second point in the clinical scheme is whether the Vasculitis is occlusive or non-occlusive. And to understand this point, we need to know the difference between two separate pathologies. Vasculitis is a pathology of the wall of the vessel, whereas occlusion is a pathology of the lumen. So inflammation of the wall, vasculitis, could be associated with occlusion. And in other cases, it may not be associated with occlusion. Occlusion, on the other hand, can occur in association with inflammation. So we have cases with inflammation of the wall plus occlusion of the lumen, which we call occlusive inflammation or inflammatory occlusion. And we have cases in which there is inflammation of the wall without occlusion of the lumen, which we call non-occlusive inflammation. And the third subgroup is what I need to um, focus on is that we have occlusion of the lumen without inflammation of the wall. And this group is usually missed. You get a patient with a branch retinal vein occlusion without vasculitis, without wall inflammation, without uveitis, no cells, no reaction, no leak in on fluorescein, angiogram, nothing. So you get a pure occlusion. And what most people do is that they look for coagulopathies. Uh, uh, they advise the patient to stop smoking, give some antiplatelets, and so on. And then two months later, the patient gets another branch retinal vein occlusion. And again, they examine the coagulation system and do some maybe laser, maybe injection for the macular edema, and so on. A couple of months later, the patient gets a stroke and dies. What could this be? This is a Bechet's disease. So let's not forget that a big category of uveitis diseases cause occlusion of the retinal vessel without a noticeable inflammation. So you examine the patient, you find no uveitis, you find pure occlusion. And these are really missed because we focus on the ocular problem as if we are treating an eye without a body, so to speak. The following diseases are most commonly occlusive. It is rare to find a patient with vasculitis without occlusion in these diseases. Bechet's disease, herpes, viridi, involvement, whether simplex or zoster, and toxoplasmosis. And I'd like to elaborate on toxoplasmosis in a few seconds. The classic presentation of toxoplasmosis we are all accustomed with is a posterior uveitis in which the patient has a scar and an active satellite and some vitreous infiltration in front of the lesions. This is but one of 12 well-known and documented ocular presentations of toxoplasmosis. Unfortunately, the other 11 presentations are usually missed because we are awaiting the classic presentation to show up. One of these commonly overlooked presentations is the toxoplasmosis induced vasculitis. We shall now see a picture, a photo of it, and there is no scar, no satellite, no anything. On the other hand, some diseases are known to avoid or to um, 
cause vasculitis without occlusion. On top of the list comes sarcoidosis and multiple sclerosis. Uh, again, one of the um, thinking paradigms we have to correct is the association of multiple sclerosis and the eye. We are very well aware of optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis. That's why many patients with multiple sclerosis are missed and the diagnosis of MS is delayed because they do not present with optic neuritis. One of the signs of multiple sclerosis in the eye is vasculitis, which could occur in absence of optic neuritis or before optic neuritis. So let's not delay the diagnosis of this serious disease, just waiting for optic neuritis to draw our attention to look for it. The third point is the size of vessel affected. The retin blood vessels are a tree, which has a main trunk, big branches, and terminal arborizations. And every disease attacking the retinal vasculature tree tends to affect one segment in particular. There are diseases that attack the central retinal vein, for example, others that attack the branch retinal vein, for example, and so on. I would give one example for the sake of time. Sarcoidosis is a disease of the central retinal vein. And it is non-occlusive when it causes inflammation in the central retinal vein. And this is so unique and so diagnostic that it is written clearly in quite a number of the UVI test textbooks that when you find a case of non-occlusive inflammation of the central retinal vein, this is a case of sarcoidosis still proved otherwise. And there are hundreds of other uh, rules which are um, which I don't have the time to go into tonight, but it would be enough for me to give you the main idea. The fourth point is the pattern of vessel involvement. Whether the involved vessel is involved in a diffuse manner or in a segmental or skip lesion manner. From the diagnostic point of view, it is of our interest or of our benefit that the case has a segmental involvement. Because in the literature today, till this moment, only four diseases have been mentioned to cause skip lesions. These are sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease, giant cell arthritis, and polyarthritis nodosis. So when you get a case with segmental vasculitis, your list of differential diagnosis is dramatically reduced. And then it becomes very easy to differentiate between them. For example, polyarthritis nodosa is a disease of the arteries. Sarcoidosis is a disease of the central retinal vein, and so on. So the list of segmental vasculitis are only these four. The last point in the algorithm, before we move to some clinical application in a few minutes, is whether or not this vasculitis is associated or not associated with vitreous infiltration. And this is another point we need to understand the truth underlying it. There was kind of a call, an old concept that active vasculitis has a reactive vitreous or some cells and protein in the vitreous. And when the vitreous is clear, this uh, denotes that the vasculitis is now quiescent. This is far from being true. Some cases of vasculitis are extremely active with a clear vitreous. Others, on the other hand, could be really quiescent and they need even tapering and withdrawal of the treatment, but the vitreous still bears a lot of cells. I shall now give you three examples on this scheme and we will go through them uh, quickly to see how far they are different from one another. This is a photo of a patient with multiple sclerosis related vasculitis. The points on your left-hand side are the five points of the clinical scheme we have just mentioned in order. 
So point number one is the type of vessel affected. Multiple sclerosis related vasculitis is a combined artery and vein inflammation. Number two, it is non-occlusive. Number three, it is peripheral. As we see, this is the terminal arborizations of the retinal vasculature tree. And it is diffused and it is associated with a vitreous infiltration, which makes the uh, picture kind of hazy. Now, what about these yellow spots? We see in the photo, these are not um, uh, cotton wool spots or any markers of occlusion, but rather they are the snowballs of intermediate tuviitis associated with multiple sclerosis. This is a classic textbook picture of sarcoidosis. And it is so educational and so impressive that I deliberately um, showed that it is taken from a book. Actually, I took it from Kensky. And the reason I insist on teaching on this photo is that it shows some signs that are really seen in a real practice, unfortunately, because the cases are mostly treated empirically by several doctors before being referred to the uveitologist or the uveitis specialist. With this photo alone, you can kind of swear that this is a case of sarcoidosis without any systemic investigations ever. The points on the left in order. Number one, it is a case of phlebitis. This is the vein involved. So sarcoidosis is a disease of the retinal veins. Number two, non-occlusive, because if this central retinal vein was occluded, we, you, you would find a flood of flame-shaped hemorrhages and cotton wool spots all over the fundus. Number three, it is the central retinal vein, the main trunk that received most of the attack. And number four, is this skip lesions, as we see that some areas are clinically affected and there are intervening areas of clinically sound vessel wall. Number five, vitreous reaction. And number six is the diagnostic feature of sarcoidosis known as candle wax drippings or tuck de bougie. If I have a few moments, I would elaborate on this important sign. Where in this photo is the candle wax drippings, do you think? Previously, there was um, kind of a concept that the candle wax drippings are those whitish or yellowish exudates surrounding the vessel. No, this is not the candle wax drippings. These whitish or yellowish exudates surrounding the vessel are known as exudative vasculites. The clinical scheme I'm speaking about today is a clinical description. There is another classification of vasculitis, which I would not elaborate on today. One of its types is exudative. It is the type of vasculitis which gives out a lot of fluid outside the vessel wall. The water becomes resorbed and the lipid remains as this cuff of greasy substance surrounding the vessel wall. So, this greasy substance surrounding the vessel wall is not the candle wax drippings. The candle wax drippings diagnostic for sarcoidosis is the uneven thickness of the perivascular cuff of exudate. So if you look at the perivascular whitish greasy substance, you would clearly see that it is very thick at some areas and quite thinner at other areas. This particular point is the candle wax drippings. And the reason that only sarcoidosis can do it is that the pathophysiology of sarcoidosis induced retinal vasculitis is inoculative. Sarcoidosis as a disease comes inside the retinal vessel wall and puts discrete granulometer. Like the cocoon of the uh, silk caterpillar. The granulometer are a dynamic structure, a dynamic creature, just like us. They are born, then they mature, then they heal or decline. When the granuloma is juvenile, just starting, 
it harms or destroys the vessel wall a little, and thus gives out a little exudate. Then the granuloma matures, becomes fully destructive and fully harmful. So the exudate is more around it. By time, whether or not the patient receives treatment, the granuloma will age, will senile, will decline. And so the thickness of the exudate around this part of the vessel wall it is reduced again. There is only one piece of information left, which is that the granulometer put by sarcoidosis inside the retinal vessel wall are out of phase. So one granuloma is still juvenile and another is already mature and the third is healing and so on. So the candle wax dripping means that the perivascular cuff of exudate around the blood vessels is not equal in thickness as, and this is only in sarcoidosis. And to convince you with, my, with this um, message, for example, TB, it's another granulomatous disease and it can cause exudative vasculitis just as this, but it can never cause candle wax drippings. That is to say the perivascular cuff of exudate in tuberculous uveitis is uniform, is even. This is because the pathophysiology of tub tuberculous retinal vasculitis is not inoculative. We have no granulometer. It is very active. The tubercle protein, which is the most antigenic part, excites the immune system of the host. And then the immune system replies by the host cells themselves, causing a diffuse infiltration of, retinal, of the retinal vessel wall. So if you take a biopsy from the retinal vessel, in a case of tuberculous vasculitis, there is no granulometer, no bacilli, no anything. Uh, Doctor, uh, you are ready to finish? You are already exceeding the time. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm very fine. I can stop. You can conclude, please. Okay. Uh, I conclude, Doctor Mohammed, with the, uh, um, another picture on the contrast of the previous one, which is a Bechet's disease, typical retinal vasculitis. Uh, no exudate, no even inflammation. You can just find a branch. Uh, vein occluded, and if we miss that this case has an underlying systemic disease and just treat it locally, we are indeed endangering uh, the patient's life. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and it has been a pleasure being with you. Thank you very much, Doctora, for this uh, well-organized uh, and prepared, uh, and make it easy for us, because as usual, you know, uveitis is all the times difficult, especially for those that are away from this field. Uh, but you make it uh, as simple as possible and easy to, to follow a rules that we can reach a diagnosis and then management. Thank, uh, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, we will have a question at the end. Now, my pleasure also to introduce my uh, dear friend, uh, Dr. Ahmed El Barqi, MDFRCS ophthalmologist. He's a consultant, veterinary surgeon, Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, uh, Abu Dhabi, UAE. Dr. Ahmed, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with uh, our colleagues uh, and our attendees. Uh, just today, I'm going to um, go back a little bit to medical retina. Uh, I know it's uh, challenging to talk about uh, DME nowadays. I think most of us know a lot about DME, uh, but I try to. Uh, no, it's all the times new. We are all the time. <laughs> no, I will try to touch it from different perspective and some clinical applications just to be uh, more interesting. So um, I talked about the DME, the algorithm. Uh, first of all, I do. We all know about the pathophysiology of DME, but I want to highlight here something very important that we're still missing some um, thing in the pathology of the DME. If you look at the literature or the textbook, you'll find the exact pathogenesis of DME is not yet well understood. But there is some theories and some evidence for that. For all sure that vascular permeability play a very important role in that, adding to this for, uh, for sure inflammation and ischemia also play a role. And on some patients, actually we've seen in clinical practice, it's not only one factor, maybe all the factors come together 
And if you add on top of this, the, uh, the general condition of the patient, which is uncontrolled diabetes, which is very common in our area, hypertension, nephropathy, and others. And I wanted to uh, keep the word others in your mind because we're going to need it later on. So in all this factor, usually we've seen what we call different response pattern. That's why we see in the clinical practice that some patients respond well, some patients respond uh, uh, poor, and there is non-responder. So this is, I think, the reason behind the different response pattern among patients who are seeing the clinical practice. So going very quickly to the treatment option we have in our hands right now, for sure, we are laser photocoagulation, intravitreal pharmacotherapy, and vitrectomy. I will start with vitrectomy first. And just we know the indication for vitrectomy, I think, in DME, uh, it's vitreal traction to posterior hyaluronic orbitrant membrane. Uh, refractory DME, uh, I'm totally against this to do vitrectomy in, in DME without traction. I have many reasons we can discuss later on, but I mean, the most important reason for me is there is no R in randomized controlled trial to prove that. But for sure, a patient like this or like that, I think he will not get any benefit from injection unless you release the traction by doing vitrectomy. Going to the laser, I think all agree now the laser photocoagulation, I think the limited only for the focal non center of DME because most of all the studies show that the macular grid or macular laser now does not have any benefit compared to uh, the antivitreal and, uh, injection. Uh, for example, patient like that with 6-6 vision, non-centering involved in macular edema with a focal leakage, I think the only way to do that for laser because I don't think that no one can inject 6-6 vision. Going for the uh, standard of the treatment now, the gold standard of treatment is the intravitreal pharmacotherapy. Just before we go that, we need to look at the, what is the ideal treatment strategy when doing intravitreal pharmacotherapy. I think we have two main uh, factors we could take check for it. We have, should have know the target for our treatment and we should have some tools to uh, achieve this target. I think all target is to maximize and maintain the visual gain, not only improving, but only maintaining the visual gain because the process of DME, a disease is long standing, it's lifelong. So we are not expecting to treat it in a very short time of period. So what about the tools? The tools we have, we should have keyword for our strategy. We should also follow the trends of the treatment nowadays and definitely guidelines. And one more important thing is outcome predictability. How could we predict the outcome during the treatment? About the key word actually and the treatment strategy is early. The, uh, when I said early, I mean early treatment for sure. You, can, you should start the treatment as early as you can. Don't wait for control of blood sugar or whatever that. You have to start the treatment early. And also early decision during the treatment journey. That's what I call it. So if you are having a non-responder or poor responder, you have to decide early what is the next step. Don't delay the treatment. Follow the trend and guidelines. What about the trends nowadays? I think we all know about the trends nowadays is the longer durability and to decrease the treatment burden. And this longer durability actually came from new generation drug coming in the market. I think you all know about the prolocimab and also Abikibar will come soon. This is longer acting uh, uh, anti-VGF. And also nowadays we are also uh, uh, modify our treatment protocol to, to, to less injection and to increase durability by treating by treat and extent. What about the evidence? What about the guidelines? Definitely when you are going to treat your patient, you should have guidelines you had to follow. Guidelines, the source of guidelines actually, it's either two sources, other than randomized control trial and real world deaths or real world life. Uh, there is difference actually between both of them. I just highlight the main difference. In RCT, we studied the efficacy for the drug to be registered we, or get FDA approval. But in real life, we study the effectiveness, not only the efficacy. Another different, big difference is the inclusion, the exclusion criteria. In our real life, we don't have inclusion, exclusion criteria. You have to treat any patient who comes to your clinic uh, despite the level of his blood sugar or whatever. So you have to treat. This is not the fact, uh, this is not the case in RCT. Another also uh, uh, difference is the tightly controlled group. But here in real world, that is a practice, a practical nature, which is more practical. Another important difference also the fixed treatment. You cannot change your treatment pattern in the RCT, but in real life, you have variable treatment pattern. And the last important thing is the follow up. Follow up in RCT is designed and you, can, you have to respect it. But in real world data or real world life, follow up is actual practice. So if the patient missed 
the, the injection, you cannot stop treating him. But in RCT, if they miss the injection, he will get excluded from the trial. So in all means, we should actually integration of all level of evidence in our hands. It's important to provide the best care for our patients. What about NDVGF? For all knows about, I think all of us knows about NDVGF. I just to highlight only the some just small point. We have many data to prove the efficacy and the safety of this drug. The treatment regimen we have in our own hand now, it's different. We have either fixed continuous dosing or individualized dosing approach. I think most of us now switch to the individualized dosing approach, most commonly the treat and extend, trying to de decrease, as I told you, the trend now is to decrease the, the burden of the treatment. What about steroid? Steroid is a very effective drug also. We have uh, uh, Neutramitral trimicinocinide is not FDA approved or not. We're not used in AUE now, but we have a steroid implant like dexamethasone or finocinocinide implant. It's very effective actually in improving our DME. And uh, we all know about side effect. What I want to highlight here, it's not to mix between the glaucoma and the increased IOP. What we have seen in practice is we have transient increased IOP. I, during my oldest career, I found only one case that developed uh, need glaucoma surgery, but all other cases just can control by uh, uh, topical anti-glaucoma, especially cataract is there. This is just to show the difference between uh, famous, uh, uh, famous trial comparing the side effect. It's not the same. Not all the steroids are the same to, be, and to, to, to know that. Uh, another important point when I go to, to check, to discuss with you is the prediction of the response, how to predict the response. We have different predictors. We can expect the response. I go through it quickly. The first two, the baseline visual equity, the poorer, the better. I mean, the visual, vis, vis, uh, vision with baseline poor visual equity are those expecting to get more vision. Also baseline central retinas also have a great opportunity to gain more uh, vein. I will go through this just to show you the baseline visual equity. This is just to show you the evidence base for that. We have many trials that prove that. Also protocol T subgroup analysis, we all are aware about that. Uh, baseline CRT are the same, the thicker, the better. Just this is trial from Bristol. But that's what I want to focus today the, is the OCT, detailed examination, because OCT, we cannot deal with just a thickness map. We should go in depth and to try to analyze the OCT to find some changes or some prediction or some biomarkers also. So first thing that the ellipsoid zone, the hyperreflective spots and the, the presence of subfluvial phyllodes. Ellipsoid zone, for sure, if you have patient like this one with damaged ellipsoid zone, I think this patient was not expected to gain uh, a vision. So if the dry macula uh, like this and visual acuity is not improving, I think there is no way to inject more compared to just normal or healthy episode zone. Another important point, I think most of us now are aware about this, but just to, re to refresh our memory about that and to know, to look exactly, are you looking to this during the practice or not? The hyperreflective spots or foci. We already see these dots or foci during the normal OCT. Before we don't, we usually overlook this and we treat it normally, but there are many trials actually show that this Hyperreflective spots or these hyperreflective spots are most could be a sign of inflammation. They could correspond to aggregates of microglia activated cells. So in this case, should we consider steroid early? Just put this in our back mind during the treatment. We'll see. Mini trial to prove that. And another point which is very important is the presence of subretinal float. There's another trial, it's not a nice study actually uh, shown that in 2017, they look at this uh, biomarker, trying to find imaging retinal inflammatory biomarkers after interview destroyed. They look at this and they found that the presence of uh, a subretinal uh, fluid or subfluvial fluid could be an indicator of retinal inflammation. And did this uh, did, uh, study dexamethasone implant versus lucentis and they found that uh, almost 85% of dexamethasone treated eyes respond or dried well compared to the uh, lucentis or lanibizumab. And this is the study it showed that result. So they conclude that the presence of uh, subretinal or uh, subfluvial uh, neurocenter detachment in addition to the hyperreflective spots could be a sign of inflammation. Another more st uh, recent study also 19, uh, 2017 also having the same finding about the subretinal fluid or submacular fluid. Another important point, which is now practicing now in my practice, it is the uh, to study the or to, to look at the response after three monthly injection of anti-VGF. 
look at the post hoc analysis of protocol I, they classify the response after three monthly induction based on the central macular thickness and the uh, uh, visual acuity gain. So if they, they found that they classify the improvement or the decre decrease of, uh, in the central macular thickness by more than 20%, those patients as good responder and expected to maintain the same gain at three years. The same also for visual acuity, baseline visual acuity, compared after three monthly induction. Those who gain more than 10 liters are good responder, less than five, meter, uh, five liters are, are poor responder and something in between. And they found that those who gain uh, 10 liters after three monthly injection are more expected to continue or maintain the gain at three years old, at three years uh, follow up, sorry. Uh, look at here, they, they found that 50% of those patients who didn't uh, achieve uh, 10 liters, less than 10 liters of the three monthly injection, they didn't improve a lot at three years. There are some patients improve, but the majority of patients does not improve. So I think this should, in our real practice, should be reflected in our real uh, practice. So now if we have patient who has, didn't respond well after three months of what is the next step? Switch to another anti-VGF or stay for the same or switch destroyed. Uh, going about the first option, which is switch to another anti -VGF. Personally, I was doing this before switch among anti-VGF in DME, but I stopped now. And when I look at the literature trying to find evidence based for that, I cannot. And I find a very nice article, review article, talking about this, the same issue, switching anti-VGF in the treatment of diabetic macular edema. What they found, they, they look at 14 trials, 14 studies, trying to find the data or proof, and they finalize that it's a great variability in the visual equity come, and visual equity gain, and also they don't, uh, they, they recommend to have a randomized control try to prove that. So since then, I stopped switching anti-VGF in DME. So the next point, to, to stay anti-VGF, give more a chance, or switch to steroid early. And there is a nice trial, actually, at 2018, actually, the switch, actually, the answer to this question is a very nice one. They uh, compare the uh, study one arm the, uh, after three monthly injection, it didn't respond well. They switch one arm to dexamethasone implant and continue with the same anti VGF for the same. And you can see here how big the difference in visual acuity gain. Those who switch early to dexamethasone implant or steroid, they gain a lot of vision compared to those who, did, who continue with the same anti VGF. So Let's go now the algorithm, my algorithm of treatment of DMA patients. So if I have a DMA patient, I classify it into either it is a focal non-center involving DME or center involving DME. If it is focal non-center involving DME, I look at the visual acuity. If the visual at 20-20, I go for focal laser. If less than 20-20, I can go for anti-VGF. And we have now protocol V uh, from DRCRnet. What about center involving DME? Look at the, uh, I sub look at the patient, individualized what we call it individualized treatment, patient per patient. If there's victimatized eye, or there is OCT inflammatory biomarkers, like we've discussed earlier, or there is hard exudates, or recent stroke for the last three months, one to three months, or tractional uh, element there, ARM or uh, uh, macular traction, or there is a cataract, a patient already cataractus, and he's going to have cataract surgery. In victimatized eye, I go directly as a first line for steroid if the patient is pseudophagic because we have many trials prove that the, uh, the, the, uh, the pharmacoavailability of the drug of anti-VGF and the vitrectomized eyes does not last longer compared to the implant. What about hard exudates? I usually go for steroid and I will share case with you about this later on. A recent stroke, uh, definitely I go for steroid if it is one or three months. Tractional, definitely vitrectomy. Cataract, I will go for steroid combination. If I go to combine cataract with injection, I'll combine the cataract for communication with steroid because uh, you know all that cataract surgery itself, it's induced uh, what we call a surgical trauma, induced inflammation. So by injecting a steroid together, I think we block both both pathway, the, the, the uh, DME pathway and also the inflammatory, inflammatory uh, uh, factor that will release in the vitreous cavity, both cataract or both surgical trauma. What about if we have OCT and inflammatory biomarkers? I look at the, uh, uh, if no, for sure I go for anti-VGF as a first line of treatment. If yes, if the patient is pseudophagic, I'll go as a first line steroid now. If fecic patient, I'll try with anti-VGF for three months and look at the result. If the improvement more than 20%, 
for sure I will continue in the same one. And if not, um, poor responder, I might switch to a steroid. Also, you can also have here the option, you can, if Sudafic, you can also start with anti-VGF for three months. But if you have a patient who has this inflammatory biomarkers in the OCT and then not respond well, I think there is no rationale now to continue on uh, the same anti-VGF. I prefer, as I, as I mentioned, the early, early word is the key word. So you switch early, you get a better result. Also, I want to add one slide here or one option if the patient is pregnancy. This one of my colleagues, Dr. Muhammad uh, Abdul Nabi, he also alerted me to this. You have to add pregnancy because if the patient is pregnant, I think we go for first line for uh, uh, steroid if possible or laser if not uh, possible. So this is for the uh, current situation now. What's new now coming on the drug? What's the new treatment for uh, DME is in the pipeline. The new concept, you know, the future measure of the UD are trying to tackle or target other pathways. And now I want you to remember the word others in the first slide. Uh, the, now the drug, what we are doing now, we have something called extracellular pathway and the cellular pathway. The extracellular pathway, what we are doing now, it's just targeting the VGF, over VGF and inflammatory mediators. But the new coming or the new th thoughts now is to target uh, different pathway, cellular pathway at the cellular level, like angiobutin 2, integrin pathway, and type 2 activation. This is the new drug coming in the, in the market. So this is, if you look at this is uh, the, the, the which we are still here now. What we are doing now is just trying to, to, to target the overexpressed VGF and inflammation. But what we are thinking now, or what is new is coming, is targeting the, in the, the cellular liver. Many pathway there still under investigation. So that is the new coming now. Uh, combination of anti-VGF dual pathway or other pathway that I told you. Also, they have some extended release platform, subcutaneous drug delivery, oral and topical even. It's still all this under trial. This is show us the pathogenesis of DME is still not understood. This is prove the fact. So this is just the new drugs coming in the market soon, the Prorosumab and the Abikibarf. Also, there is another anti, uh, anti uh, uh, dual, you call it Farsimab, it's a dual uh, action uh, targeting anti angiobutin 2 in addition to the anti VGF. This is the Boulevard study. I'll not go through it for the sake of time. Integrin pathway, there is also some integrin uh, receptor have a role in the uh, pathogenesis of the virus eye disease. And they, they are investigating now a drug called RCG. We're waiting for the result. And the result, the study is called Delmar, phase two now. Uh, what about systemic subcutaneous drug? We have something called TI2 activation. If you remember from physiology, TI2 activation is a key regulatory for vascular stability. And we found in diabetes, this uh, TI2 activation is downgraded by a certain enzyme called VEPTP. So they are trying now to, to study a drug that can block this enzyme. So it's called subcutaneous, given subcutaneous. Injection. The drug is the name under trial, it's AKB9778. So they are trying to study uh, the, the efficacy of this subcutaneous injection to activate this type 2 activation to, to restore the integrity of the blood vessels. So the time two, there's a trial now going on. I'm just, just show us, just uh, show you how going on. Also, they are trying now an oral treatment called oral doses. This inhibits connexin 43 protein to prevent opening of the channel. They are also under investigation uh, comparing that. The, the last one is topical drops. Uh, they are trying to use a topical 1.5% dexamethasone, and they are trying to uh, uh, to 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 uh, study or uh, innovate what we call SNB, the cellulosic ocular nanoparticle technology, which can increase the concentration of the uh, drug inside the eye. It's a specific uh, vehicle to increase the concentration of that eye. So even topical drops, they are achieving try it, and this is the trial going on. Extended release platform, it is a new coming in the market now. They are trying to uh, uh, do a new implant. For all know about this port delivery system, BDS, I think it's available now and the about to be available. It's only for, in, for MD for sure. It's not yet for diabetic, but I think once it's approved for NMD, it will be applied for uh, the uh, diabetic. This is the cases of the uh, this, uh, BDS. It's called ladder trial. It's phase three now, not phase two. 
just to be fast. Uh, so after all of this, what we've discussed with you, we need to some facts. I, I will repeat myself in this slide, the last time I mentioned the same, that we are not curing the disease. The disease is diabetes was incurable. We are just treating the DME. So we have to accept this fact. Another fact, as I mentioned, we are still something missing in the pathogenesis of the disease. One more thing, the last thing, that one size does not fit all. We cannot treat the DME with a single treatment or single drug or single protocol. We have to use all our women, especially the new coming drugs to help us. So to conclude, before sharing with you very fast two cases. What we know now that uh, DME pathology or pathogenesis is still not under many factor there. Anti-VGF for sure commonly used, but have a burden on the health care system. And we don't reach, we don't want to reach the chronic DME because it's lead to irreversible visual loss. And again, here, I, re I recall the word early. So do not wait until the edema become chronic. What we need in our practice efficient treatment, identify predictor outcome, also early identification of the response of anti-VGF and early decision, which way to start, which switch early at the early stage. If we merge both what we need, what we want, so we can reach our right target is to treat the right, to get the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Just two quick cases uh, with, to share with you from clinical practice with this one, with the first one with the case uh, diabetic with hyperreflective spots, you can see here, bilateral severe edema, and you can see here the hyperreflective dots there. So I start in this patient with intravitreal anizumab after three monthly injection, didn't respond at all, no, no improvement in both eyes. So I switch to aflibercept. At that time I was still switching, but now I stopped that because this is one of the reasons because I didn't find any response. After three consecutive monthly injection, the same, exactly the same copy paste especially changing the, the reflectivity of the fluid, but the, in terms of thickness and visual gain, it was the same. So this patient received six monthly injection of two different anti-VGF. So I think we all agree that the only solution now is to switch to dexamethone implant. I switched it really, and after six, three months later, you can see the visual act improved and look at the OCT to complete dryness. But as again, if you look at the ellipsoid zone, it's disturbed, that's why the vision does not improve well. And here the question came, if I, if I use in this, in this patient steroid early, will be the result different? I mean, the final visual outcome result because I delayed him for six months. This is the other eye the same. Another patient with hard exit. It's very important to share with you this case because I discovered in, in the patient who has a uh, uh, hard exit like this patient. For example, this patient received four monthly injection of ranimizumab and the last injection was done five weeks ago. And if it came to me, if you examination 2400 and you can see how much the uh, extensive heart exit around the macula and on the fovea. So the plan for this patient was easy to me. I would check, I will definitely try with dexamazone implant. And one month later, the vision improved and look at the OCT what I want to highlight here is the, the, the resolution of the hard exudate and the edema subside down. I look at here, just it's uh, for sure we have some bleak on the fovea, but it would not, uh, not approve, it would not go away. But look at the pre and post. This is pre and this is post injection. You can see how uh, fast the resolution, also the density of the hard exudate at the fovea was resolved. If you look at the evidence for that, we all know about Bivordex trial. They found that the uh, dexamethone implant has a much higher instance of greater regression of hard exo and diffusion of that. And also there is another trial, ongoing trial, study the effect of dexamethone implant on hard exit of diabetic macular edema. So I believe that uh, using hard uh, diabetic, uh, sorry, a dexamethone implant or steroid in patient with hard exit at early phase, I think it will prevent to accumulation of this hard exudate at the fovea and lead us to permanent visual loss. I hope I stick to my time and thank you for my, very much for your attendance. And I hope I uh, uh, succeed. <laughs> thank you, Ahmed. It's an excellent, as usual, as I tell you. Okay, I will just stop sharing now. Okay, one, one by one. I cannot uh, leave my eyes away from your talk. It's thank you, my dear. Thank you. Uh, attractive. Uh, there is one question very fast because this one maybe we'll lose. Can you go to your the second the case? He is asking what are those lesions out of macula? Which one? Second case. Second, 
It's, yeah, I think in the second yes. This is my the hard exit. Yeah, yeah. Only hard share exit. again. Hard exit. Yeah, it's hard exit. Just hard exit. If you look at this one, let, you, let me check here. If you ask it about this, all this. No, he's uh, saying, he's saying the first. He is saying the first. First case. And PRP. Yeah. PRP laser. Ah, uh, PRP laser. Uh, let's go back. Let's go back. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, these live. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This patient actually has a full PRP. If you can, this yeah. too close, PRP. a little bit too close. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very old technique. Big yeah. uh, laser scar. So that's it. Okay. If there is any question to Dr. Ahmed from any panelists here, please. Dr. Ramzi, Dr. Amjad, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Iman, anyone want to ask Dr. Ahmed? Especially about the algorithm he, he have done this one is an excellent, I think. I think I it's very good. And, and just a very just nice mention. summary. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Hassan. I was just going to ask, have you any experience, Dr. Ahmed, with micropulse laser? For DME, yeah. for DME? No, 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 yes. I agree with you. Uh, this is the only way we c we are waiting, I think, actually, for a um, uh, randomized control trial to compare the macropulse macular grid, for example, versus anti-VGF. But uh, in my hand, I didn't try it. Uh, I'm treating, as I told you, if it is macular uh, uh, center involved macular edema, I go direct for anti-VGF. Uh, I think, Ahmed, this another weapon we, we didn't hear touch it, يعني, but there is a lot of people that are doing this and there is yes. a good result. I think yeah, I agree. Are, yeah. So there is one he is showing, please, can you show, show us the, the table comparing the steroids? Table? Show, please, the, the, the table comparing the steroid, comparing steroids. Ah, steroid, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is just to show, uh, okay, I have to share the screen again, okay. Uh, just meanwhile, you know, share. Uh, there is any other comment from any other colleagues here? It's um, well, I mean, I, I just think all this. Uh, I think most of us retina specialists are with practice are concluding that steroids have a much higher role than we previously thought. Um, and I think a lot of people, um, you know, I mean, as far as my practice goes, that you know, we're. I'm, uh, I'm more inclined to use uh, Ozerdex and, you know, implants and all that than previously. Yeah, uh, this is a question for all of you, if uh, anyone to want to uh, answer. Don't yes. you think that if we shifting as Ahmed, uh, switching, sorry, as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, can we do it after three injection or we are still thinking about six injection? Uh, as you know, because whenever we delay the switch or the management, and that means it will lead to a chronic ischemic changes. So also the effect of uh, the, the steroid, it will be also less, not as we expect whenever we are shifting as early. Is there any opinion about this one or any comment about this point from any of the speakers? Yeah, I, I can tell you, you know, if you look at the study I shown that shall we stay or shall we switch? I think this answer uh, answered the question. If you switch early, you definitely you will find a better result if you can. Uh, rather than delayed for six months. And it happened with, in my case that the one I show you, it's a real practice. And that's why it stopped me, uh, as I told you, to uh, uh, switch among, among anti-VGF and DME. I directly, so I if mean, I want to are you going to switch after three? I mean, the, yes, the debate- Yes, now, now yes. Three? Now if the, if the patient- Or you is... have to wait because there is maybe some of them, there is a late effect. Are yes, still... exactly. Yeah, I agree. I, the question is here, after three monthly injection, if you have very poor response, I, I believe that uh, this patient, not 100% VGF permeability or VGF trigger disease. So it could be some sort of inflammation there. And we all know about that. So I believe if I switch early, I have nothing to lose. Rather than, comp comp uh, I, I'm talking about, again, if the response is not well, I mean, less than 20%. Let's yeah. say five or ten percent. So that's why. But if there's yeah. something in between, Ahmed. I can still keep the injection. Yeah. Ahmed. Yes. Yes. Uh, what about the young uh, patient with phacic patient and uh, with resistant to uh, anti VGF? Do you switch the steroids directly or try the other anti VGF? And as you know, uh, at least in my experience, I observed that uh, Mr. Aflubercept is 
more effective than uh, bevacizumab. In some patients with is not a uh, response to uh, ranibizumab or uh, bevacizumab, and when I switched to aflibercep, I can uh, take a good results. So, what's your indication? What's your uh, behavior you know, in young yeah, this, patient? This is in young. Yes, I have yeah. one patient like this. Yeah, I will. Uh, yeah, uh, as again, you know, in our practice is different than. You know, to switch to another anti VGF, you can you might find it in your hands different. It, it depends on the patient from patient. But as I mentioned, there is no evidence for that if you switch among anti VGF. For this patient, we he received a six injection. Also, uh, we switch because of the, as you mentioned, his young age, and he refused. When we discuss with him the steroid, the side effect, we might get had some cataract, and you might some increase of IOP. He refused at the beginning, but so we switch to anti VGF. Uh, trying, but we know, and it does not work at all. And at the end of the day, we give him a steroid with this after discussion of the patient. And he improved, the macroedema improved, and uh, he was lucky that we don't have any cataract in this patient. Despite he's 32 years old and diabetic, till now he don't have any cataract. It was, I mean, six months earlier, six months later. So I believe, you know, it's, if you want to to inject this kind of patient, you have to discuss or counseling the patient very well. Tell him all the about side effects you might have and what are the tools. But in my hands, I found no uh, evidence, no, I mean, no benefit from switching anti VGF uh, among the endemic. Because you know what, uh, Dr. Ramsey, the issue when you switch, if you switch after three monthly injection or after six months, what when you switch between anti VGF? That's my question. If you, for example, if you switch after six monthly injection of ranimizumab, and now you try, decide to switch to aflibercept. So, what is your pre treatment protocol? Do you uh, calculate the previous five injection, months. or it will be naive patient? You have to start another five injection according to Vivid and Vista. So, this is good point. So, if you can also help me, uh, yeah, if you can tell me if you want to switch, what is your protocol? from aflibercept uh, or whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah, if you switch, how, after how many injection of ranibizumab you switch and for how long you are going to use the new uh, aflibercept? Do you consider it naive patient or you count from the first injection of uh, uh, Lucentis or ranibizumab? Let me I answer uh, this question first. May, uh, in naive patient in my practice, I usually start with aflibercept because yes. I uh, experienced that uh, it's more effective there is some okay. difference about the uh, effectiveness between ranibizumab, bevacizumab, and aflibercept. Uh, if patient come to me uh, with uh, several injections previously somewhere, I count this, and uh, if it's uh, that if it's resistant still, uh, I can switch. But uh, I do not switch after three injections. At least for five injections, I continue. If still, but sometimes six, but. Between three to six injection, I continue. And if they're still resistant, I can switch uh, the others. Uh, but if the patient received uh, bevacizumab and ranibizumab before, I can uh, switch to aflibercept. If the, she received, uh, he re uh, the patient received aflibercept and I continue still resistant, then can go to steroids. Okay. Uh, but Dr. Ramzi, how many injection after ranibizumab? Uh, uh, like, how uh, many injections will continue? Not, not three, percent. but uh, at least for five, sometimes uh, six injections. It depends. Depend. If it is definitely ineffective, there is resistant. I can uh, decide to switch after four injection. But a three injection is sometimes I think is may make, uh, make a uh, mistake. So uh, after three injections, some patient I observe that like four and five, five injection uh, may respond, and therefore I usually prefer to do more than three, but uh, rarely six. Okay, we have uh, uh, questions here. Uh, any benefit of uh, uh, posterior subtenon trimcinolone instead of doing uh, uh, intravitreal injection of uh, implant, Ahmed? I have no experience. I never do this. Uh, any other have any experience of that? We, I have. Uh, before dexamethasone implant, before anti-VGF era, we used to use uh, trimcinolone, intravitreal, and subtenon also. But subtenon injection has um little uh, 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 um, benefits comparing the intravitreal uh, therefore uh, we uh, made a study uh, with uh, so, so with a limited case and then stop at do not do subtenon but uh, if we would do steroids i think it would better to do intravitreal injections but 
Uh, as I agree with Dr. Ahmed uh, about the side effect of uh, ocular hypertension is glaucoma. Usually, dexa implant is much safer comparing the uh, transonal uh, intravitreal injection about uh, glaucoma complication. Yeah. Uh, we should prefer if we do if, if it's available. We should prefer dex implant instead of uh, transonal. I think. Uh, we have one question or one of the dear uh, friend. Can we uh, ask Dr. John to prepare Ahmed Jumaa? Then we will have Dr. Hassan comment. The, Ahmed Jumaa is with us. He is raising hand. He want to ask. Can you open the mic, man? Yes. Uh, yes, Hassan, can you go ahead, please? No, I was just saying, uh, Subtinon, uh, I think the fact that it is closer to the interior chamber, and sometimes most people have difficulty getting under the tenon all the way back, closer to the macula, they end up putting a Subtinon close to the anterior segment. And that is a really high, risky for cataract and, uh, uh, you know, secondary glaucoma. So, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I see a lot of that. So I think intravitreal, actually, it's compartment, compartmentalized into the Osrodex, let's say, capsule, and also away from the uh, trabecular meshwork. Therefore, you have less, uh, less risky for glaucoma and uh, other complications. Great. Okay. Also, we can, we can observe sometimes a uh, uh, necrosis on the conjunctiva if it's inject uh, just the uh, anterior part of the eye. And the particles in Tramsodon may stay there for a long period of time, also may uh, cause some uh, necrotic uh, conjunctival changes in that area that I have some cases that uh, they inject and refer elsewhere. as uh, may cause reactions and the white uh, plaque there. So it's really important to do injection. If we do subtenon, real subtenon injection, go to, uh, behind the equators. Okay, uh, Dr. Ahmed Juma, if you are here with us, please unmute yourself so that you can uh, uh, participate with us or ask your questions. Uh, till okay. we... Hi, everybody. I, I just ask, uh, what is your management for those with long-term or chronic uh, foveal lipid oxidate. Thanks. Uh, macular, you mean? Oh, foveal, uh, foveal. foveal uh, oxidate. Okay, you can stay with us, please. Uh, so you can yes, have thank you. Uh, any question. Yes, Ahmed, if you want to Yeah, I think, about you, know, uh, you know, if you reach a stage of the found this Blake, thick Blake under the fovea, I think there's nothing to be done. Uh, the, 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 the only way is to prevent this from happening. If you have fovea threatening hard exit, I think uh, using a steroid, in this case, it might help to prevent migration or ex extending this hard exudate or Blake under the fovea, as we see from Bevortex trial. But uh, if you have there, there is nothing. There is no surgical treatment, as I know, or there is no way to do that with anti-VGF or uh, steroid more, because it's already it will not there. Help Ahmed even. It will not decrease Sorry. that even in the... Well, yeah. uh, we are, you know, we are talking about Blake. When you reach the stage of Blake, which is thick uh, uh, layer, it's it's uh, it's very difficult to be resolved, honestly speak. But for those other hard exudates with lipid exudation, some it's a little uh, li less thick. I think this can be resolved. That's the, uh, exactly the same case I show you. All this uh, lipid dis uh, disappeared except the Blake under the the the, the fovea. It stayed there, and this was the limiting the visual. Uh, uh, again, in this patient. Uh, any other uh, uh, any other experience with that from Dr. Ramzi? Uh, Dr. Yeah. Ahmed, uh, on the other hand, in patient with uh, very severe macular edema with heart exudates, when we uh, dry uh, uh, fluid with uh, anti vgf for with steroids, with steroids especially, uh, with fast uh, drying of the macula, we can observe that the heart exit can move to the center of the foia and became a kind of plaque. Yeah. So, yes. therefore, um, I think sometimes I really hesitate to use steroid and to dry the macula fastly and may uh, cause a moving of the exudate plaque uh, materials into the foia and the vision can get worse in these patients. And... Um, you know, years ago, uh, we used to uh, use surgical treatment of this patient. And uh, I have some experience about, maybe I mentioned about 15 years ago, uh, in patient uh, with heart exudate accumulation, if the uh, exudation is uh, behind the retina, 
but it's not fibrous uh, scar plaque developed yet yeah. before this development. If we go supratenal area to remove this heart uh, exudate, we should, uh, in this patient, we save some uh, ambulatory visions. And I, therefore, I think still we uh, think about to do surgical removal because technology in the retinal surgery increase. Surgical removal in uh, heart exudate and supratenal heart exudate material before uh, fibrous uh, scar tissue develop can be really uh, effective. Uh, it's still, this is my experience, and we published this study years ago. And but in, if the fibrous scar is developed, uh, it's never uh, works. And uh, we but, do, uh, sometimes, do not Dr. Ramzi, you, you, sometimes on the OCT, if it is long standing, you, you are not sure exactly. You cannot differentiate. You will be, not be sure this is fibrotic or black uh, on the OCT. So, and I think some patient of this, yeah, for example, this patient, the visual actually was 2100. Uh, and if you do a uh, big surgery like this and the removal and uh, detach the retina and go under and remove this plaque, uh, we are not sure about the visual equity post-operatively. So maybe you, you find it, you open it, and you find it, it's a fibrosis. So you do the surgery for I think, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, uh, we need a lot of, to be, have a lot of cases to, to try to differentiate pre-operatively which is one is fibrotic and which is not before going for a, a, a height. I mean, this is a aggressive surgery for sure. So uh, this, yeah, sorry, Victor. go ahead, yeah. Dr. Ramsey. Uh, years ago, we tried this surgery several cases, but we don't, we, I do not perform this regularly, but especially you, know, you're right. It's not possible to differentiate uh, fibrous scar tissue or uh, fresh uh, heart exudate spread in the OCT. But sometimes it's, you can you can guess you can imagine because plaque is in submacular area is a kind of hard uh, thick uh, uh, hyperreflective uh, area on the foyer. Yeah. The other one is can um, be mobile uh, sometimes on the uh, uh, supratenal if there's some uh, supratenal exudations, and therefore in some selective patient the patient has a good vision. I mean good vision is like uh, 120 or 0.1 vision. And there's a huge uh, uh, macular edema and supratenal extradition also, supratenal uh, fluid also. In this patient, I really hesitate to do a steroid injection and to cause the moving of the extradate material into the foyer and to reduce the vision. And I have some experience with this patient. These are really uh, controversial and challenging patients mm, and yeah, to yeah. decide what we will, uh, what, how uh, we can uh, yes. treat this patient. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, any other comments from dear friends, dear colleague panelists? Uh, I think, uh, dear, uh, uh, you get the answers. Uh, Dr. Okay, so we have maybe one uh, last question. Um, can we uh, uh, combine the early steroid and anti DGF instead of switch? Uh, you mean on the same setting? Uh, not in the same sitting, but I mean, you give one injection to injection, then give steroid like this. This is the way of the meaning. Uh, of uh, because, okay. you know, I, I, you because you know, I, you know, because you know, I, I, I've heard, I, I've known some physician or some doctor presented or talk, give a talk. He is giving uh, at the same uh, triamcinolone with Avastin and the same syringe. So it has been. I mean, I, I hope that this is a question. If you can inject on the same setting, because. Uh, no, no, it is, no, it's combination. Combined. I mean, yeah. combination. If you injected three monthly injection for anti VGF and you switch, I don't call it combination. I call it switching. But if you inject one month of anti VGF and the next month inject uh, uh, steroid, it's some somehow for me it's not. Com it's like uh, early, very early switching. Let's say that because it's not uh, combined. I don't have. I'm not aware about any studies or big trial that study that okay. to switch. So I, I can, I can, can I have here, Amjad, yes, Amjad. I can Amjad, comment Amjad, please. Yeah, please. I, ha I, have, I have a few patients of mine that uh, we start off with an anti vegf like Dr. Ahmed does, and after three to four injections, there's no response, we give a steroid, long-acting steroid implant, and, and uh, then they do well, and then they get a little bit of edema again, and you still know the steroid implant is working, I will give another anti vegf and that often helps. So we have people that have a six month combined. This is what we call combined. Combine. So it's like uh, it's like topping up. It's like top up, right? Top, top up, up with anti vegf. 
on a patient who has already yes. implant inside the eye. Okay. So basically somebody that's responded to steroid, but it's not 100% or they responded and then they come back with a little bit of fluid and you still have no the implant, the steroid implant is working. I have no problem with giving them anti-VEGF at, at that moment. Yeah, when I was practicing in the U.S., I used to do both combination, both anti-VEGF and uh, trimcinol the same uh, the same time, the same time. Oh, this time. Okay, very good. So, uh, okay, before we came to the last, this the I think last question. I think this one will go back to the first presentation. Uh, I think uh, this for Doctor uh, Ramzi. Uh, if if cannot tell it is fungal versus bacterial, is it okay to inject antibacterial and antifungal at the same time? So if so, you cannot differentiate, is it a bacterial yeah. or fungal? And uh, uh, and there is an endophthalmitis, is it okay to give the same at the same time? I think, yeah, maybe this is option, but uh, if, uh, if I would have such patient, I would prefer intravitreal uh, uh, oh. antibiotic injection and systemic uh, antifungal treatment. Uh, you will not give antifungal uh, intravitreal? Yeah, this is, it, it can be, but I didn't, I did not have any experience. I did not do this, uh, both antifungal and antibiotic injection intravitreal, but uh, systemic treatment is also effective in uh, fungal endothelmitis. And therefore, I would prefer systemic uh, antifungal and uh, intravitreal antibiotic and see the uh, uh, progression if there's some improvement or if not, maybe in the second step, I would prefer antifungal injection because un uh, fungal antifungal is not um, uh, acute, is not um, massive, it's so, uh, slowly progress and still we have time we can do an injection the second time. But this is my just uh, theoretical uh, behavior. So I do not have experience like that. Well, that so means you can I, wait I, until I, the I, result, I, to get the results maybe, then after that you can decide. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any, any other comments, Amjad, yes? Yes, I've, I've, had a, I've had patients that are severely immunocompromised and they're in the hospital and HIV positive or on uh, chemotherapy and they have an indigenous endothelmitis. And sometimes in those cases, it's really hard to tell because no really good immune reaction to, to really differentiate fungal versus bacterial. So like Dr. Uh, Ramsey said, we always start in systemic antifungal, but I have also injected voriconazole and antibiotics just to cover it all because sometimes the those, the immune, yeah, it, can be, it can be tough to differentiate. And so so I, I, I share the same experience that Dr. Hamad. Uh, when you get a bilateral endophthalmitis, I, yes. I go ahead and I, I do also an intravitreal amphotericin. So the cl clinical scenario gives you an idea if you should proceed with intravitreal amphotericin uh, also. So the fact that the patient immunocompromised by bilateral or some recent surgery like lithotropsy surgery or some uh, other in intervention, some huge uh, venous cannula or uh, things like that, then maybe you should consider uh, uh, fungal endophthalmitis and go ahead and inject amphotericin also. Yes. Okay, I, I think- I do by the way. I'm, yeah. using amphotericin. I'm trying to finish really? <laughs> one question more. I will finish with this one. How long does it take to give, uh, to get, sorry, ob obvious improvement after starting antifungal Systematically, is I uh, think for Dr. Ramsey. Um, depends patient, but um, usually uh, we need a few days, like three to four days, to see some improvement uh, with systemic treatments. But uh, intravitreal uh, injection, we add uh, if you do intravitreal injection, we see uh, improvements uh, like uh, uh, twenty to four or forty eight hours after injection. Usually we can see improvement. Uh, I have, uh, I, I don't want to, to move before I answer these questions. This is from my dear uh, friend and dear classmate, uh, Dr. Ismat. I think Amjad, you can, uh, Ismat Arifish. So what is the recommended intravitreal antibiotic dose for infant and pediatric age group? She's in the YouTube, following us in the YouTube. Anyone having any experience or? Hamad? What I, is? I, I don't. I don't have a, a lot of experience with the pediatric endothelmitis because they don't, they're not typically getting intravitreal injections 
or cataract surgeries at a fat enough rate to, to get a lot of those cases. Uh, with, I've seen a few uh, pediatric cases of oncology patients or chemotherapy with indigenous uh, uh, fungal infection, and we use the same dose when we inject them. The, I mean, it's basically uh, the, the volume of the eye is what you're worried about because you have diffusion of the medicine into the eye. And uh, I believe the eyeball volume or after the age of two or three years is very similar to the adult as far as the vitreous cavity. So you don't really have to moderate a whole lot with the, with, with the doses you're using. And uh, uh, the, what, we, we, I have not seen cases of toxicity by using the regular adult doses in those kids that have had, uh, that I suspect have indigenous endothelmitis. Uh, any other I believe that I believe the thing, the, I uh, I believe the only thing you should be modified in pediatric is the systemic dosing because you, you need of to course. consult the pediatric. He was the one to give you how much you can get per, per kg. But I think for intra uh, ocular or intravitreal, I don't think that uh, the dose will uh, will affect because you usually take a vitreous tab even in, in terms of volume, not only concentration. You draw like 0.2 and you inject 0.2. It's, it's a term of a small globe or something. You are doing vitro step first. So I think yeah. for intravitreal injection, I think that those uh, does not change for the... Uh, for the I don't know, period. Ahmed, if I, if, I, if, if I imagine about this one, whenever you are giving uh, anti-vitreal, anti-VEGF, uh, you are having not the same dose. When we are giving uh, 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 anything inside the eye, we are changing the, the dose for pediatric. Why in exactly. case of antibiotic? Why in case of antibiotic? We think we are there is no the, the, the pathology is different here. If you are talking about the ROP, for example, for anti VGF. No, I'm talking about antibiotic. What is the difference? You know, you because are, we are not giving any uh, kids or any uh, even adult intravitreal antibiotic unless if he has endosalmitis. I mean, no other reason. If you so, are giving oral antibiotic, you are not giving the same as those as well. Yes, yes, but you know, so, the systemic, so the systemic absorption. That there should be another, uh, I mean, uh, special dose for antibiotic for children. Exactly, but my point is the systemic absorption of the drug, if you take it IV or oral, it's more, you know, cautious. You have to be more cautious, but if you inject inside the eye, uh, it's, it's not, it's only limited to the, the ocular space and you cannot, you cannot know, you will never be able to know if this drug, if you make a study, if you want to make a study to check the, the safety of intravitreal antibiotic for kids, you will never be able to say that's crazy because the toxicity could be from the bacteria or from the toxin, not from the drug itself. It's not the case like anti-VGF, for example. But, so that's, what, that's my concept, but we don't have a study, I think, as much as I can. But uh, for me, if I have a kids, I will give the same dose for... Uh, uh, antibiotic intravitreally, but for sure I will consult the pediatric to give us the systemic antibiotic dosing. Dr. Iman is still with us. Dr. Iman is here. Dr. Dr. Iman yes, Dr. Here. Muhammad. Yes, Dr. Muhammad. Can you give us your opinion? You are also dealing with uh, uveitis and maybe if you can have a children of uveitis and you want, did you ever need to, or endophthalmitis, and you did you ever need to give antibiotic inside the eye? Inject? Actually, my experience with uh, infectious endothelmitis is not uh, um, is not as wide as my colleagues' experience. I'm dealing okay. mainly with the non-infectious uveitis, vasculitis, optic neuritis, and these things. Okay, Hassan, if there is any comment from Hassan, please. Yeah, I just want to say that I I do I don't change the dose, intravitreal dose um, for kids. That's number one. Number two, very important point. There's some anterior segment specialist here. Uh, probably. Please, um, uh, subcon subconjunctival antibiotics is not the same as intravitreal antibiotics. Yes. So it's, it's, it doesn't work. Um, you know, it doesn't work. And this is just really important because, uh, and I hope uh, and I wish that people don't try to resolve this problem with subconjunctival antibiotics because they don't, they, it doesn't work. So that's just my last two cents. Okay. I don't know. Still, there is a question. I don't know. Can I get this also question? I had the case of one year old post phaco in the palmages, uh, which they inject intravitreal antibiotic, but the baby I become uh, uh, physical, yeah, with within two weeks. So, my question: Would you consider vitrectomy as a first treatment 
This is the last question. I will not take any others. So if there is any comment. Can, can you repeat that question you know, again? Me, I didn't get it. What was, what was the uh, question? Can you, it is there, uh, of Ahmad, uh, I'm, I'm just, can you open the question in question and answer? You will find it, the last one. Okay. I had a case of one year old post, PECO in the palmitis. You are reading? Yes, I'm reading it. So, yeah. so the, 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 it, it's, it's a one, is it, it, I mean, there's somebody who had in the palmitis one year after PECO? Yeah. One year old. One year old. One year old baby. Both if, fake the palmitis. If, if it's two weeks out and the eye is already becoming tricycle, so this is a really bad prognosis eye. I mean, you, it, 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 obviously they've had some severe inflammation and it's coming tricycle means that I would do an ultrasound check on the retina. There probably is a retinal detachment and there's probably a membrane in there on the ciliary body. That's why it's becoming tricycle. There's really no good answers here. I mean, you could consider vitrectomy but, but as long as the parents and everybody else understands that this is probably going to be a, a heroic I measure see. and most likely you will not be able to save the eye. But it's two weeks, still two weeks out from the infection. So it's a, it's a possibility. But I would not raise their hopes up, especially with a young kid, that you'll be able to do anything. But obviously, no. because it is a young kid, I would offer that option. And I would see if they want to go with it, as long as they understand what the prognosis is. I think I believe this patient. Uh, I, I think I think this baby, you know, two weeks is too long to wait after the uh, he injects and he get a vitreous tab. I believe tab and injects and then he wait for two weeks. I think uh, vitrectomy should be done at aerial stage after we do the first uh, tab and inject and then. I, for sure, you have to admit this baby and to see him next day if you cannot find any improvement because we cannot now follow the guidelines of EVS uh, that about BL or not BL. So you have to go for vitrectomy. What I want to highlight here, uh, uh, we know we should understand that uh, we all know that endosalmitis is a devastating uh, complication. It's not only vision threatening, it's globe threatening. You might lose the globe by evisceration. So I, st I think we should be more uh, aggressive in treatments uh, in terms of, for sure, evidence-based, but for this baby, I believe he gave injection of antibiotic and he didn't improve because if he responds to the antibiotic, we will never reach this stage of being thysis eye. The, the, the issue here, the patient, the baby is, get antibiotic intravitreal, but he didn't respond. So he should do vitrectomy at early stage, next day of the injection. That's my uh, opinion. In this situation now, if the patient is already thysis or the eye is thysis, this is the final stage of uh, endostalmitis. This is the stage we don't want to reach it from the beginning. So that's Actually, my comment. The, the one who was asking, Dr. Patma, I think, her name. Yeah. Uh, she's saying that uh, it came later on to her when already it, uh, in uh, thesis eye. You know, Muhammad, my 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 yani my my um, concept about endosalmitis, it's 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 a it's a, it's a dynamic event. We cannot classify it as severe or mild, moderate, severe. It should be classified as early and late because in one day, in few hours, the, the, the dynamic change can be changed at all. So we, we, what, what I'm doing now, actually, I'm not relying on EVS at all. I'm just trying on the red reflex. If there is a red reflex, good reflex, I can go with fitter step. If no red reflex and the vision is hand motion or counted finger, I will go with vitrectomy. Because if you look, you know, I want to ask, this is my last comment about EVS. If you look at the, the, the study, if you go through the details of the study, if you look at the group who didn't do vitrectomy and look at the incidence of retinal detachment and thysis, you know, it was almost double, more than double in the vitrectomy group, despite the fact there is no change in vision. But if you look at the complication, those who didn't do vitrectomy, they developed double percentage of thysis and retinal detachment. So I think we should consider or uh, the EVS guidelines in nowadays we have the other way around. Isn't it the other way around? And patients who do vitrectomy. No, I have it. I will show because you know I, there is one study called CV. There is one study. I think guys, this is a Maybe I can. I think Dr. Ramsey was a comment. Yeah. I think actually I agree, Dr. Ahmed, about the EVRS study. EVRS distinguished the reasonable guidelines for the treatment of bacteria and ophthalmitis about more than 20 years ago. But many things changed during these 20, 25 years. Yeah. And the technology we check to technology, it's get much better, and we can do surgery much safer comparing the previous years. And therefore, 
And also there's increasing trend to do early vitrectomy in such patients. I agree with you. Yeah. What about the, the young, uh, la- uh, the babies, one years old baby? Again, I agree with you. I would, uh, so for the babies, we uh, do injection uh, you know, on the general anesthesia. And um, therefore in that patient, I have no experience in one year old endophthalmitis, but I would prefer to do vitrectomy uh, as early as possible, maybe just vitrectomy after the, uh, this uh, endophthalmitis. Also, it's not possible easy to give uh, 0.2 milliliters injection into the small eye. And therefore, you could do vitrectomy and like uh, limited vitrectomy and give injections could be much uh, reasonable uh, comparing the injection. So agree with you again, Dr. Ahmed. Yeah. Um, I actually, I actually disagree, and I think I think tap and injection is the way to go. As the recent also retrospective uh, from the European, uh, I understand. I mean, uh, we can do vitrectomy and core vitrectomy much easier, but the devastating complication can occur uh, with vitrectomy, especially in friable uh, retinas. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I mean, sometimes no, I mean, I mean, look, yeah, trouble, yeah. sometimes you can deal with things that happen on its own uh, versus you. Hassan and Ahmed, I think we will make another small webinar for you again. <laughs> no, 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 it's OK. <laughs> we all agree that we have to try uh, tab and inject. But the only issue, if no improvement, you have to go yes. direct. For protect. Don't wait. That's Absolutely. No, I totally I agree. Yeah, that's that's the point. I think we're all in agreement. Okay. Uh, I think we already came to the last point and uh, last of this uh, webinar. I would like to thank you all. It was uh, very interesting. I was thinking this webinar, it will be exactly as the time I was deciding by 10, 10, 15 maximum, but now already we are about three hours. I don't know, but it was very interesting because the, the speaker, they are eminent and the talks are very important. There is a good point they raised and debatable about it. Thanks for all of you for accepting our invitation and we hope to see you inshallah in uh, another webinar. Thanks Dr. Ramzi and Dr. Amjad, my dear friends, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Ahmad and Thank Dr. Ayman. Thanks for the company, for sponsoring company uh, Alergan for their support and thanks for Marvijan for managing this event. And good night. Bye-bye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good night. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See Bye-bye. you soon. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye.